one, two, we have a quorum. Um, we're going to go straight into closed session first. So there it is, order and closed session, boom. And, and, and now it's official. Um, we're going to this meeting to order, and we're going to go directly into closed session first. Oh, I had to. Okay, I've been on vacation. <laughs> Let's go ahead and round the room. Uh, Franco is, is here. David Kwan. Here. Uh, Dick Santos. Yeah. Andrew Gardiner. Here. Eshvar is not here. Dave Wilson. Here. Howard Lee. Present. And Sunita. She's on her way. She's on, it's, but Eshvar begged off, right? Is, is it? Is he not coming today? Oh, he is coming today? Excellent. All right, well, we'll do another roll call when we get back from close. Can I go into closed session now? Please, Mom, can I go into closed session now? Are we good to go into? Can we? Um, yes, we can go into closed session. All right, so we're going to we'll duck out for about, what did you figure, 45 minutes an hour, Maytag? I'm sorry? What do you figure, 45 minutes an hour Well, or I'm something? not sure. There's two items for closed session. One of them is which I'm recused. So I'm not sure how long our conference council um, Russ Rapeda needs. Is is Russ on the line? Do we know? No. no oh, well. there, w there won't be. So I, I believe. Well, if you're if you're recused, I'm sure it'll take about thirty seconds because we won't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So if there's not going to be any um, recusal, then I would estimate the the closed session would be about fifteen minutes. Oh, okay. Oh, for that item, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll try to be back by nine thirty, folks. Thanks.
want to go ahead and hey Jay, I want to go ahead and get started again. Uh, we'll, we'll start uh, just right from the top, even though we don't have to. So, meeting is called to order. I think everybody's here now, but let's do. We wait, we wait, hold on a second. Um, yeah, go ahead. We have to wait for the meeting until we get the recording back on. Oh, got got it. So um, we're back from closed session. Nothing wait, wait, hold on still. I think they're still working on the... Really? Uh, I thought I heard it was... It said stopped. stopped. Oh. So they're going to try to put it back on. Is that you, God? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Let I me know when we can go. Recording in progress. Oh, there we go. There um, go. Okay. Hey, we're back. Closed session, nothing to report out. We're going to go ahead and start from us. Uh, oh, before you go on, oh, yeah. um, so there is nothing to report out. And just for the record, um, Reed Smith, Harvey Lederman, Maytag Chandler, and Mariah okay. Fairley recused ourselves from closed session item 1B. Right. We had a legal matter and we had an HR matter, and Maytag and Harvey helped us with the HR matter and then left the room. Thanks. Um, Let's go ahead and do a roll call anyway. As soon as I saw Doc in the ladies' room, she'll be right out. Uh, Franco. Here. David Kwan. Here. Dick. Yep. S Andrew. He's, he's here somewhere. Eshvar. Here. Dave Wilson. Here. Howard Lee. Present. And Sunita just walked in the room. Okay, let's see. Um, I, I, they give me a piece of paper every time, so I'm just going to kind of read for, from it. Um, item 1A, just cause under AB 2449. For the record, um, every trustee is here in person. We're not utilizing that. And item 1B, emergency circumstance under that same uh, assembly bill. For the record, again, everybody's here and nobody's utilizing that. Okay, then we'll move on to orders of the day. Um, before uh, we do that, yeah, we ahead, do have man. one item for to wave sunshine on. Um, I'm not sure if they no. That, well, they want me to do orders and then do wave. So I've, okay, I've, sure. I've got it. So, no, so, I've so for orders of the day, if I could please ask for items 4D and 4J to be heard together. Oh, great. And okay, then, and, and that dovetails nicely to the first item under orders today, which is uh, Bill. Hi, Bill. Um, Chiron's asked for live Bill. You can drive the bus any way you want to. Okay, it says um, the order will be 4 E, F, followed by 3 A, B, G. Next time, make up your mind, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that Ann back there? Hi, Ann. Um, great. All right, now we're going to do wave sunshine. Um, we, I'd like a motion we, to we wave sunshine. We need a vote on the orders of the day. Do we? Yes. yes really? Okay, I uh, need a motion to approve orders of the day. So moved. I need a second. Second. I have a, a first from Santo, second from uh, Vado. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right, uh, we, we're going to wave sunshine on item 1.4E, the PNF dashboard, and item 7.2F, which is a, a soup of initialisms, a PF, ACFR, blah, blah, blah. So motion to approve. Uh, do I have a second? Second. I have a motion by Santos. All in favor, aye. 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 Great. Any opposed? Uh, um, floor's open. Any citizens want to say anything? Yeah, welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm back. I had six weeks in Spain and Portugal. I'm tan and gorgeous, as you might expect. Um, <laughs> I'm going to pull something off the consent calendar. Does anybody want to pull anything else off the consent calendar? I put something on there called Engineering Alpha. It's work I did right before I left in August. I want to go through it with the board. I'll take a motion to approve all the consent calendar except item 1.4G, Engineering Alpha. Do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I have a motion by Santos. So I have a second. I have a motion by second by Gardner. All in favor, aye. 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 Great. Um, can you guys pull up that engineering alpha and go to the first color slide? Uh, the one right before that. Great. So, gosh, I've been here almost, I've been here over 13 years. I joined right when you did, Dick. So, I keep telling you guys that Vince Sanzeri at Hayes Mansion in February 2012 came up with a plan that's actually worked out pretty well. In fact, we have Jay in the audience. Jay is one of the guys, the beneficiaries of this, right? So 
It's been going on now for five years. July 1st closed five years we've been doing it. And I wanted to let you know, God bless Vince Lanzari, wherever he is, we should give him a medal. Here we go. So this first slide says, in green, well, there's our discount rate and our actual return. Those are in our CAFRs. Those are hard numbers, right? And there's a benchmark return. There's a benchmark. We, we trust Laura Wirick and her friends at McKee to give that to us. If you look at that presentation, I double checked. That's a pretty good benchmark. They know what they're doing. And there's the alpha we generated. Now, for those of you with financial knowledge, alpha just says, did you do better than the other guy? And in fact, in this engineering alpha, there's a text section, sort of like alpha for dummies that I, that I wrote, right? So if you're a financial guy, there's only one thing that stands out to you from that alpha column. And it's not the numbers. It's the fact they're all positive. So you know, alpha can measure luck or skill, and you want to get out of the luck part. Well, I think you hit five home loans in a row. That's not luck. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Hello. <laughs> all right. So you can multiply the size of the fund by that alpha, and you can see that over five years, our team has generated about $130 million worth of alpha. So if we believe what I just said, let me put it in plain English. Any other team would have generated zero, and they generated $130 million. So Vince was right. Next slide. Let, I'm only going to show three slides. There's a whole long thing there. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, okay. All right. So 12 years ago, like I, you know, this seems so stupid. I've been doing this for too long. We got tired of going to conferences and being told we suck. I swear to Christ, sometimes you do the weirdest things in life because people tell you you're ugly. And Vince said, we don't suck. You guys all know this. We have to be more conservative than our peers. And Vince said, there is a way for us to be more conservative than our peers, but have the same return. And that's skill. That's alpha. And so unusually for a pension plan our size, we hired a team to see if they could generate alpha. Now, I've just shown you they did. So we can ask Bill and Ann, and I did in July. All right, so there's kind of like four scenarios here, and you can see them. The first one is, hey, what if we were any other pension plan and we never hired our team? What would we do? Well, okay, that's the baseline. The city savings, there wouldn't be any savings. We're just plugging in the computers, generating return. Then we can say, well, okay, but what about, what has our team done to date? Right? Now, don't forget, if we return more today, we have to contribute less tomorrow. Because the plan that's 80% funded kicks in a lot more every year than the plan that's 85% funded. And so it can be argued that although the team has generated to date 130 million savings, over the next quarter century, it will generate another, roughly. Okay. Now comes the important part of this presentation, right? We could also say, well, the team fell apart, but we, we decided to raise our discount rate to our peers. And that would save the city almost a billion dollars over the next quarter century. And now for the big deal. If we keep our team intact, and if we raise our discount rate, which is the whole reason we did this in the first place, this, I hope everybody's listening to this, we forecast the city will save or be given a billion dollars over the next quarter century. A billion dollars. Not for our fun guys to build libraries, to do everything else. All right, hang on. Now I'm going to read something. And this is the most important thing I will ever read on this board. You, as soon as I read this, you're all going to get a copy of it. Here we go. I've been a fiduciary of one sort or another for more than half a century. 
I first became one when my father died a week after my 16th birthday. I became a fiduciary for my brother and sister. I became their trustees. I've been a fiduciary now almost 100 times. There are two core fiduciary duties, those of care and of loyalty, to do what a prudent person would do in service of the person or organization one is a fiduciary of. Here at San Jose, I have finally come up against a fiduciary challenge that I cannot surmount. So this will be my last meeting, and what I'm reading to you now is my resignation letter. I will leave this board and this meeting when this brief memo I'm reading is done, and I will not return. I'm not leaving by, by choice, and I beg you all to attend to my brief following remarks. They are the most important thing I'll ever say. They're important enough to force me off a board I love and that I've been a part of for well over a decade. I have labored alongside all of you on this board to solve our plan's financial straits. Vince Sanzeri suggested a path to do so more than a decade ago, and guess what, folks? He turned out to be right. Barboni's team, we have Jay back there, are the instantiation of Vince's vision, a vision he came up with 11 and a half years ago. Put bluntly, Vince and Prabhu gave birth, deliberately gave birth, to a goose that lays golden eggs. Golden eggs. Consistently, predictably, and sustainably. We pulled a rabbit out of a hat, folks. There are people who say you can't generate alpha. I'm a venture capitalist, guys. All I ever do is generate alpha. I'm a very wealthy man. I do it well. I've just detailed our goose's performance, and I think we'd all agree it's stunning in its extent. Given that, others naturally covet our golden goose. I've been ringing an alarm bell since late last year that we need to protect this goose of ours or give up ever enjoying its golden eggs again. It's been pointed out to me by people I trust and respect that I must stop ringing that alarm bell. They've explained to me why, and I can see they're right. But my instinct tells me that. If I stop ringing the bell, the goose will perish. Our team will leave. That's the fiduciary challenge I cannot get beyond. I'm being told, and rightly, to stand down and watch an imprudent disservice happen to the city we all love. I'm being told to violate my core fiduciary duty, right? Hang on. Hang on. We're, we're, we're in switch. Switch gears here, guys. Well, so, sorry about that. Uh, uh, hang on. Hang on. I'm, uh, let me, let me, uh, I have a slightly, a slightly older version, so sorry. In the older version, I smack people around. In the new version, I'm fairly friendly. To stand down and watch an imprudent disservice, disservice happen to our city. To violate my core fiduciary duty by choosing instead to do my superficial or prescribed fiduciary duty. And after being a fiduciary for so many decades, I just can't get let, let go of that higher fiduciary calling. So I'm going to resign from the board today in what will amount to a very clear breach of my prescribed fiduciary duty by crying out one final loud tolling of this alarm bell that I feel is my more important fiduciary duty. So please, please listen while I call out in gory detail this alarm that I feel is so dire, I'm willing to fall on my sword and leave this board I love that I've been on for 13 and a half years. And I'm resigning specifically in hopes my resignation today will carry enough impact to open a path forward, a path I will detail later in this memo. So here's what I believe so strongly, and it's just a belief, but I felt compelled to sound alarm for many months now. And you don't agree with this, right? It's a belief, it's a prediction. First is that if we don't soon compensate our investment team commensurate to their golden performance, 
You cannot argue with the numbers I just showed. The only piece you can question is the only piece I question, which is the benchmark. And if you read what I put in the consent calendar, I generated a comparable benchmark using public sources. The benchmark is correct. I believe this team will start to leave Hamas in the first quarter of 2024, and I believe that now since probably October of last year, a little over a year ago. The second thing I believe, and this is the more important one, and you really need to listen to this, because I'm an expert in this area. We won't, I believe, it's again a belief or prediction, we won't be able to just simply rebuild this team once it dissipates. Some teams are unique. I'm a venture capitalist. My job is to find unique teams. And those unique teams can't be easily reconstituted with new faces. A half of all startups fail. And a half of those, one in every four startups fails because a key person or a small team leaves. So I believe this with all my heart and soul. Some teams are unique. That's a fact. I believe this team is unique. Not everyone agrees with these two predictions, nor should you. And they are just that, informed bets about a myriad of possible futures. If my prediction proves true, and I hope it doesn't, the unfortunate impact to our system and to our city will be enormous. I truly believe that if we lose this team, it will delay, I mean, look, I did this, but even I don't quite believe this. It will delay our getting to fully funded by more than a decade, and it will cost our city a billion dollars, not our fund, our city, over the next quarter century. And yeah, you heard that, B, billion, right? 50, 60 million dollars a year for the city to spend on vital services. And that, my friends, is a fiduciary duty I will not, I, I cannot shirk. Next page. I understand and appreciate the political realities of our city council. If you're hearing this, Pam's here, council members, those numbers are not a threat or boast, nor am I challenging your fiduciary competence. I appreciate that you are staying true to your fiduciary duty, duties, just I'm staying true to mine. So, Pam and, and Council Mayor, let's find common ground in the belief that here in the Silicon Valley, all around us, we see the impossible magnitude of what unique, small, high-function teams can accomplish. I met Steve Jobs and Wozniak right before they started Apple. They're just two knuckleheads in search of a dream. Let's take this shared belief in how special this team is, and let's work hand in hand over the next month or two to bring home that $1 billion for our city. Again, not our fund, a billion dollars for the city to spend on services. I believe this small, high-function team that our board, and you too, the City Council, helped design and assemble. City Council helped, it gave us Measure G, which allowed us to assemble this team. And more importantly, I believe this unique team alone can deliver that level of performance. If you, Council, and boards briskly get at this matter, I believe there's still time to keep this goose laying its golden eggs for our retirement system and our first city for many years to come. Now I'm going to breach my fiduciary duty. Can I please stop you there? You you can't breach your fiduciary duties, and I want to counsel you whatever you're going to well, say. Well, this this is a resignation letter, so I've already just resigned, and can, may I be allowed by the board to finish my letter? Sure, sure. So Great. as long as it's clear on the record that you're oh, yeah, speaking yeah, as yeah. a public member yeah, at yeah. this point. Y yeah, you, you just jumped to the bottom of the next paragraph. So here's the final sounding alarm, right? I've said this for over a year, there is one possible solution, though not the desired one, and let me be as clear as I can be. I have never suggested what I'm about to say is the desired solution. 
Uh, a solution, not desire, would be just spin Prabhu and just team out into a separate company. Plan B, in case the preferred plan A, a city-sponsored incentive compensation system, failed. A lesson from the startup world is to always, 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 how many people I see and tell this to, keep the magic inside the system. If your boss will let you do it at your big company, do it at your big company. And that's your plan A. But the lesson learned is to simultaneously have a plan B in your pocket to spin the magic out in case the system rejects it. This is not rocket science, folks. The goal is the magic, not keeping some system appeased. Eshvar and Anurag, Joint Personnel Committee, shepherded Plan A, a well-thought-out city sport incentive system, as competently as any of us could have. I was there every step of the way, and they did everything right. A year ago, man, maybe 10 months ago, I would have put the odds of that Plan A succeeding at 90% or higher. I now believe that if the facts on the ground don't material change, by month's end, plan A is dead in the water, may already be. It's that warning alarm to get ready, not to execute, but to get ready. The reason you have plan B is that you can do things in parallel, right? To get ready for plan B in case we needed it because plan A failed, and that's the alarm. Now, by sounding, and Maytag pointed this out, by sounding this alarm so many times, and now, so bluntly and forcefully and right out in the open, counsel, and she just did, assures me I've crossed a bright fiduciary line. Said in simple terms, I've felt compelled to breach my fiduciary duty in order to do my fiduciary duty. Like I said in the beginning, folks, this is a fiduciary challenge. I can see no way around. Nor can the half dozen or so experts, I've paid a lot of money on this one, guys, and mentors, I've unearthed people who are almost 90, whose wise counsel I've sought since May. In over 50 years and across nearly 100 fiduciary assignments, I've never come remotely close to breaching my fiduciary duties, but I just did. In the world, I inhabit, that leaves me no ethical choice but to resign. You don't breach your fiduciary duties, right? It's a big, huge no-no. And I just did, but I felt like it's okay because I did it in order to do my fiduciary duty. I'm damned if I do and damned if I don't. Many of you know the story about Alexander the Great and Gordian Knot. Well, I found my Gordian Knot. All right, here's the plan. I sincere, and you're all going to get copies of this when I walk out of the room. I sincerely hope my resignation frees up the following path. I urge this board to meet immediately with its sister board, Federated, in an emergency joint closed session meeting to be informed by Harvey and Maytag. I urge this board to consider the steps they will lay out for you and to pursue those steps with all due haste and speed, you will find in some of those steps, you will need other people to help you, and they will be ready to help you. I've been sitting here in SRS help. I've been sitting here in the background getting ready for plan B. There are some pieces already in place. I urge this board to take the results of those steps, if they're favorable, again, you have to make a decision, to the city and urge the city to help with the subsequent steps council will lay out. I want you to go, if this works out the city, and say, hey, if you help me, I'll give you a billion dollars. And if they say no to that, uh, it's imperative. This board and city council will continue these steps by Thanksgiving and complete them by Christmas. Now, one of my forecasts was that the team would leave in early January. I think if they see you working on this, they'll stay in place. So maybe you have a little more time now. 
So are we kind of uh, going no. to a self-fulfilling prophecy? Oh, exactly. Well, it's very Heisenbergian. I, I, I wonder if this meeting is, uh, I don't know, others are not speaking up, but... Uh, no, well, hang on, I'm not done yet. Let me finish. Uh, you know, I, I'm intentionally interrupting. It's very disturbing because I feel like we might be we might be disturbing the system itself. Oh, well, uh, so well that, and, and, well, and, and that advice. is the reason why it's, it, so, it's our breach of fiduciary duty because they're not supposed to talk about it. Yeah, but I mean, let are me, we really having a hey, meeting? Hey, hey, hey guys, me, I, hey, I'm chairman still. No, I have you're the floor. not, though. I am not no, chairman. Not. I don't have the floor. You don't. The next paragraph is the best. So paragraph. I understand that. So let me just make something clear for the record because there is confusion. Councilman Foley had just raised that the board needs to re accept your resignation. Under the board policy, just to be clear for everyone and also on the record, the board does not need to accept Drew's resignation. So for, at the time that he had stated he is resigning at that moment forward he was no longer chair and was commenting as a member of the public any member of the public can make their own comments but there's nothing that we you know can do to interrupt their that's their free speech and so i just want to make that clear for the record for everyone in the room as well as for the board members um, I, re I did review the policy for the election of board members and there's nothing in that policy that requires so, us to so accept. mr chairman may i finish my brief remarks thank you before I conclude, I want to make some, I want to make clear that my resignation has nothing to do with, and everything to do with recent allegations made by our internal auditor and whistleblowers. It has nothing to do with them because I've seen to date, and nor have any of you, any allegations of any unethical or criminal behavior. Just typical, inconsequential, sloppy processes, which probably I take most of the blame, not Roberto, <coughs> that we hired an internal auditor to uncover in the first place. That doesn't surprise or alarm me. It's all in Dave's work for me as a trustee. I chaired 10 audit committees, so it's something. But it has everything to do with this because while everyone is wringing their hands over this diversion, our investment staff, some of which are sitting on, just watching closely, getting fed up with this clown show, rightly concluding the city could care less about the golden eggs, a billion dollars they've been working their tails off to generate. And if they're as smart as their seller performance says they are, and I think they're this smart, they've already got their resumes out on the street and are counting the days until they jump to a place that will recognize and reward them for their proven talent in golden eggs. And that's my second prediction. You cannot, and I could be wrong, right? It's just me. I don't think you can reconstitute this team. These are not field replaceable parts. And in my defense, and for you to believe me, I am in the business as is Howard of identifying unique high function team. And half the time, you cannot reconstitute them or replace them. That's why venture capital exists in the first place. That's precisely the sort of chain of events that's had me repeatedly ring an alarm to get ready to hastily execute a plan B in case plan A bottomed out, which it appears to. The takeaway message for my resignation is simple. While Nero is playing his fiddle, Rome is reducing itself to ash. Shame on everyone involved in this kerfuffle, including me, for taking their eyes off the ball. The golden goose Vincent Peru labored for more than a decade to give birth to. I challenge anyone, anyone, and my door is always open to grab beer, Hearing this message to deny, you have the presentation, that the billion dollars San Jose stands to reap is not real, or deny it's mere inches away from our in the city's grasp. Molon la bay. Final point. The transgression that is forcing my resignation comes with a steep price. I've been advised by both inside and outside personal counsel, I've spent a lot of money on this, that I should not communicate with you board members after the speech. Frank, I'm, I'm obviously for, for you to call on to help with matters not related to this speech. Nor should I 
help prevent teams to spin out, which I will not do, nor should I benefit in any way from the spin out if it's formed. Trust me, I'm on 10 boards. I got a lot more things to do. The price of my saying these words that cannot be spoken is of necessity excommunication. It's been an enjoyable honor to work with all of you. And I hope you all, God, I hope you all believe me, when I say I spent months since April laboring to find a better solution to this intractable fiduciary dilemma and a better way to save our golden goose than resigning in so dramatic a fashion. Adios. So with Drew's resignation under our board policy, um, like I mentioned before, he, we, the board's policy does not require that we accept his resignation. However, in the event of a midterm vacancy of the board's chair position, the vice chair shall immediately assume the position of the board chair for the balance of the term, and the board vice chair vacancy would then be filled for the balance of the term in accordance with the rules of this policy. And for this policy, for the uh, vice chair position, in the event of a midterm vacancy of the board chair, vice chair position, nominations for replacement of the members will be taken at the next possible regular meeting, and the election will be held at the next possible uh, regular meeting immediately following that in accordance with the rules of our policy. So with that, um, we do have Vice Chair Votto taking, taking the position now as chair. And uh, we also have later in our um, agenda, uh, agenda item, I believe, um, for nominations for the yes, chair, vice yes. chair for the year. Yes. Right. We have a, we have a four I, which is the nomination of position for board and vice chair. So we are we have time to do that later in the agenda. And so with that, I turn it over to uh, Chair Votto. Congratulations. May I, may I <coughs> ask a point of? Personal privilege. Would it be possible for you to move to the head of the table so we can all see your face? Yeah, I was just going to suggest we take a quick five minute break. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good idea. And break.
head and uh, grab our seats. We'll call this meeting back to order. somewhat unexpected. I do, however, want to give um, members of the board an opportunity to address things that were said. So anyone would like to start? Anyway, uh, <clears throat> being on this board for 26 years, something like that, uh, Real surprise, I had no idea. But I can tell you it's like losing a brother. Uh, the um, impact he had on this retirement system, the um, changes, the positive things. And uh, when he talks about Vincent Seri, uh, you can talk about investments, but Drew's the kind of person that appealed to everybody, whether it be labor, POA, local 230, the firefighters, police officers, everybody he was always able to mediate and bring people together. He was um, he was like just working with another firefighter. I would have been proud to and have the confidence to walk with him into any major fire knowing that uh, we would come out together. Uh, I was totally taken back by surprise. I don't know all the issues personally. It's kind of rambled on and I'm kind of emotional at the time so it's pretty tough. But uh, I love the man and I appreciate everything he did for this city the police and fire, and for the residents of San Jose. Uh, love them to death. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Andrew. No, I want to thank, thank Drew for everything he's done for the last, I think you said, 13 years. Um, this board was at a very different place around 2010 when he came on, came on board. Um, and he did a lot of good in in the changes over the last you know, 13 years. Um, so as a plan member, um, knowing what he's done and where we've been and where we are now, um, I wanna thank you for um, your service. Sunita? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, this is a surprise to me that um, I was introduced to, to Drew um, from my former colleague, Sean Greenfield. And um, I can tell you, based on my experience working with many boards um, as a consultant or as an employee, uh, I'd be hard pressed to find uh, any single board member who's more committed to his constituents, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, than Drew. So uh, that's a, that's a, I wasn't aware of the news, but. Uh, it's a shock and, and it's um it's very unfortunate i think thank you um, um thanks. thanks michael um i guess i'm struggling to separate the um you know terrific service that drew has provided to the board um from what i just heard uh, i i mean the others have spoken up about his service so i don't need to regurgitate that but i must express that i was extremely disturbed that um, as chair uh, and then you know switching to public member it's a fine line it's easy to couch under the fact that it was a breach of fiduciary duty but if you're still sitting there it's the the, the perception and reality are different and um, i personally would recommend my co-board members not get unduly pressured by the message uh, and the fact that the team might leave. I think that the fact that we even said that, I've never heard it before, um, is I, I'm concerned that puts the system at risk and I would be amiss if I didn't speak up uh, as my fiduciary responsibility to, to uh, sort of address that head on. And, and um, I understand that this was a, a subject that was complicated in terms of incentive compensation and compensating people for their good work. But I do, um, I do feel a bit, uh, 
uh, as I said, disturbed that somebody would use their pulpit to sermonize us and potentially put undue pressure. And I, I don't know how to say that in a better way, but I do respect Drew in many other ways, and I'm not going to take that away from this, and uh, hopefully I can process it more after this meeting. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, first of all, yes, uh, I've worked with Drew. You know, I've been on the board a little over five years, um, and I worked with him, um, and I appreciate his service. Um, and you know, he's, he's generally been supportive of the things which I've done. I, I chaired two committees, the investment committee and the joint personnel committee, and both of which I think are you know, kind of the heart of the issue that he talked about. Uh, and on that, I completely disagree with him um, because I think, I think this board um, <coughs> has um, worked hard in terms of you know, improving governance, um, in terms of trying to retain our investment staff, um, and we've also worked, um, you know, to try to compensate them, uh, and we continue to work on that. Uh, and I don't think that that uh, battle is over. Um, but I think the course that Drew suggested, um, I don't think, is the right path um, for this fund. Um, so I disagree with uh, what Drew suggested there. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I do want to thank Drew for his, uh, his service. I, th I think he has uh, a, a lot of um, energy, thoughtfulness, and knowledge and experience, and I think he, br he was an asset to the board overall. Um, his, his departure today was uh, a surprise to me, and uh, it, was, uh, it was disappointing because uh, you know, I felt he was an asset. I think the ideas that he expressed as a public member uh, were things that I, I had no awareness of, and I, I don't have any way of judging whether or not it's, it's uh, valid, real, or something that we could um, take action on. So I, I, I can't endorse anything that was discussed in terms of his ideas, but I, I do, um, I do uh, say that I, um, I'm disappointed that he's, uh, he's left the board. I'll just say real quick that, like Andrew, as a plan member, I'm grateful for the things that he instituted and helped get this plan going. And I can't say that I've always agreed with him or his tactics, but I would like to thank him. Roberto. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I'll leave the comments from our former chair, Lance, uh, uh, just what he just said, I want to address that issue as between him and, of course, the rest of the board members and the public. But I do want to, uh, he did spend uh, over 12 years as a trustee of this board. Uh, and I have had experiences over the last 27 years working um, with different boards across the state. And uh, I, I think it, it is important that I recognize uh, the engagement and, and the hard work uh, by uh, former chair and trustee Lanza for the Police and Fire Board. So uh, I do want to recognize that. And I want to, uh, on behalf of uh, the members of the plan and on behalf of the staff of the Office of Retirement Services, uh, we want to, to thank him for his work and uh, his support throughout his tenure as a trustee of the board of retirement. Um, Prabhu, I think you are attending remotely the meeting, I think, and you wanted to also, I don't know if you, I believe you wanted to also say a few words, but if you are listening. Yes, thank you, Roberto. I'm here as well, and like Roberto, I'd like to thank Drew for his 14 years of service. And like uh, Trustee Sunzeri before him, uh, there are big shoes to fill. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah first, uh, reiterate that I um, want to thank you, Drew, for his service. But um, the topics and the issues that he brought up uh, during his resignation speech was a surprise to me as well. I don't think we ever discussed it in any form or committee me meetings. So total surprise on my part. Uh, last, I want to say that I th 
being on the board for maybe coming on two years, uh, I think the board really appreciates the investment team and have been very supportive of the team. I think we try to do our best to show our appreciation to the best you know, way possible. So definitely want to thank the investment team for all the hard work and contributions. If I could just say one thing as legal counsel to the plan, um, you know, I share the same sentiment as many of the board members. Drew was a very strong leader for our board and he really helped us through a number of issues. And we, I thank him as well as for his service. I just want to make clear for the record that council does not endorse any of the positions that Drew has outlined in his um, resignation speech as a public member. Okay. Thank you. Nothing else? Then Mr. Chu, yes. Uh, I would like you to consider um, making sure he gets a plaque or some kind of certificate from this board for all the years of service. We'll work on that. Thank you. Mr. Chair, you asked me, and I think I gave you the answer, but I want to confirm with council, the consent calendar was already approved? That's correct. All right, okay. I just wanted to make sure that I gave you the right information. Thank you, council. Okay, then that's to the CIO for investments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there are no agenda items uh, this month, but I do want to let the board know that on Tuesday, in November 14, I will be presenting to the City Council an annual, our comprehensive annual expense report like previous years. Uh, this is Tuesday, November 14, uh, around 1.30 or 2 in the afternoon. So uh, please do tune in if you are interested. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take questions. None. I guess we'll move on to number three, old business, continued deferred items. That 3A, discussion and action on economic assumptions to be used in the pension fund June 30th, 2023, actuarial valuation to be presented by Chiron. quickly ask a question because uh, in the orders of the day, Drew said we could do things in whatever order we wanted. Uh, we would like to do 3A and B at the end of our pension items. And so uh, it, if we proceed now, we would start with uh, the items, the new business items, or okay. we could defer that's, these. That's to fine. The, You're up there. Fine? So let's have you keep going up and down. Okay. I will uh, share my screen. <coughs> Bill, I cannot tell if the microphone is on or not. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you now. Thank you. Yes. And just for the record, so that we have it clear, so you are going to be covering um, which items in which category, uh, which order, I'm sorry? Uh, the uh, preliminary pension valuation results, I've, I've, I've put the agenda down, so I don't have the sure. number four, here. 4D. 4E, then 4F, and then 3A and B as a single item. Okay, thank you. So I, I think we have the perfect antidote to the fireworks that started the meeting here. Uh, <laughs> 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 We're going to be talking about the actual issues for the next hour. <laughs> 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 Very calming. <laughs> So uh, it, it, I just wanted to start uh, with a reminder of where we are in our actuarial schedule. Uh, so today mm -hmm. we're, we're going to start with the presentation of the preliminary pension valuation results. Then we are presenting the demographic experience study and, and trying to um, adopt some changes to demographic assumptions. Uh, and then we're bringing back the 3A and B, which were the economic assumptions and the asset smoothing method issue and getting decisions. So um, that will give us all the assumptions and methods to get the pension valuation going. It's also our regularly scheduled time to do the OPEB uh, assumptions. And so it is a full presentation of assumptions uh, today fr from us. And then we'll be back in December with the final pension valuation and preliminary OPEB and finish the OPEB at the February board meeting.
So uh, the the preliminary results are very close to uh, the projections, but uh, slight increases. So uh, the funded status has increased uh, slightly from 79.6 to 80.3 on a market value basis and 78 uh, to 79.9 uh, on, on the actuarial value, if I have that backwards. Uh, so not uh, a huge change in funded status that reflects, uh, well, we'll talk about the different pieces, but that reflects the investment returns and the uh, census data changes since the last valuation. For uh, contributions, the uh, members' contributions would tick up slightly as a percent. That's really uh, mostly the transition from, continuing transition from tier one to tier two where the members contribute more. And the city contribution would increase uh, slightly as a percent of pay from 76.5 to 76.9. Uh, and then a little bit more as a dollar amount going from uh, about 208 million to 215 million. Uh, and, and you'll see that part of that is we've had an increase in payroll. So we're going to uh, do a little actuarial 101 with the asset smoothing method. Um, and this uh, graph, these graphs here show uh, the actual gains and losses over the last five years. Um, and your smoothing method basically takes um, uh, the expected return on your investments and compares that to the actual return and any uh, difference between that is an actual gain or loss. So on the left hand side that chart uh, the green bars show the actual returns on your investments for the last five years and then the blue bars show what was expected. So that difference is the actual gain or loss on the market value of assets. So if you go back to 2019 that um, loss was $127 million, um, and it's all of that now is completely recognized within the actual value of the 2023 uh, actual value of assets. So each year we've shown what those gains and losses are, um, and then in the right-hand side, the dark green bars are the uh, value of those uh, gains and losses that have already been recognized with this valuation, the 2023 valuation. So um, you can see the dramatic change in the gains and losses back in 2021 where we had almost an $800 million gain. And then the very next year we had a $600 million loss. Um, and so for this current year, we have a small gain of about $63 million and we are only recognizing 20% of that, uh, that gain in the 2023 valuation. So 80% of that value is being deferred. So just a quick question quickly. Uh, sure. Just trying to wrap my head around this. So the methodology has been we recognize 80% of the gain or loss in the year it occurs and then defer 20%? Right, so you're uh, recognizing yeah, you're oh, recognizing okay. only 20% and 80% is deferred. So 793 divided by a billion 44, I'm just trying to, not that good at mental math, but is 76%. So it what seems like we recognized a lot in 21. It's percentage wise, right? So, so over the year, so 20% of the year, after four years, it will be closer to 80%. So 21, 22, 23 with 60%, right? Yeah, let's, let's look at the table on the next yeah. slide. Yeah, the table on the next slide shows the actual numbers and it's easier to, to, to see. So at the very top, we have the market value of assets um, at $4.7 billion. So the current year investment gain of $63 million, um, we only are recognizing 20% of that, so we're deferring 80%. We're deferring $50 million of that gain. And similarly, when you look at all the previous years, for instance, in 2022, it was a $614 million loss. And we're, we've already recognized 40% of that, right? So we're deferring 60% oh, okay. of that. 
Okay, so when we add up all the different deferred amounts from each year of the last five years, that total net deferred loss is $23.2 million. So not a lot, but the fluctuation from year to year is pretty dramatic because there was such a swing in 2021 and 2022. So to come up with the actual value of assets, you take the market value and subtract the deferred gains or losses. So when you're subtracting a negative, it's like you're adding to it, right? So the actual value of assets is a little bit higher than the market value because there's those deferred losses that are going to be phased in over the next four years. So it's important to understand this. We were spending a little time on this because it's important to understand this calculation to understand our recommendation when we get to right. the, the last slide. Right. And you can see right now in 2023, like the numbers show, uh, that we don't normally have it in a period where they, the actual value and the market value are almost the same, right? They're very, very close. So you tend to have a little bit of fluctuation in between the two, but we're very close right now to, to being the same with those two. Yeah, I, I understand the current methodology. Thank you. So this next slide is just showing membership trends. I think the thing to um, take note here is that we have been seeing increases in the active membership over the last few years, but this year there was actually a decrease in the membership of about 50 members. So your support ratio, the number of inactives to actives has gone up a little bit this year because of that de decline in the active population. So this slide is showing um, the changes in the UAL from the last valuation to this valuation, uh, there was a slight increase of about almost $10 million um, due to some offsetting factors here. So your contributions uh, that were coming into the plan last, just for last year decreased the UAL by $66 million. And that's because it's, um, it, with uh, Bill's previous slide showing how much uh, how much of the contribution is going towards paying off that unfunded accrued liability is almost 20% of pay, and that's why you're seeing a decline in the UAL because of your contributions paying off that principal on the unfunded. Uh, there was a liability experience of almost $70 million uh, loss, and that was almost solely due to the salaries being higher than expected for the year. And you can see in the graph on the right shows the magnitude of the different gains and loss, or the different sources of the gains and losses, and the salary increases are the green bar. So most of that $70 million was due to salary increases. Um, now, there was a slight investment loss. I know we, I had just said there was a gain for the year, but that gain was on the market value of assets, right? So the gain, uh, the loss here takes into account that there were about 30, or no, not 30, about $80 million in deferred losses from the previous valuation. So we're recognizing some of those uh, losses for previous years there. So just a slight actuarial loss on the actuarial value of assets of about $5 million. And then this slide just shows uh, the historical uh, gains and losses by source and, act and changes in the unfunded accrued liability. Uh, over the last 10 years. Um, I think the most important thing to note on this is that the liability losses have overtaken in magnitude their impact on the UAL. It, it, over the last 10 years, it's about 232 million. Um, and then your returns, the returns on the actual value of assets, it contributed 200 million. So there has been more liability losses than uh, the asset return losses. and. Again, those are mostly due to salary increases um, in every period on this chart. I guess a positive before we, we go to the next. The one, it is very positive that the contributions in excess of the tread water, the amount of contributions that the system is receiving has reduced the unfunded accrued liability by $400 million. And that's more than any of the other sources have increased it. Unfortunately, there was, there's more sources that have increased it than the one right. source that's decreasing it. But hopefully going forward, we're gonna see more gains on, on the investment returns as well. Because we've over the past decade, we've done well in reducing that assumed rate of return. Including all the alpha we've generated. <laughs> Couldn't <Yeah>. resist. <laughs> 
Yeah, so um, this is just a discussion item to update you on the preliminary results before we look at any assumption changes or anything like that. Uh, so take any questions on this. We will, uh, in the next item, get into much more detail on the, the liability losses uh, because that's really the focus of the demographic experience study. What is the meaning of tread water here? Yeah, it, so tread water, we, we've presented this in the past. We didn't lay it out here. We probably should. Uh, so tread water is the amount of contributions you need to contribute so that if all assumptions are met, the dollar amount of the unfunded liability remains the same. And, and so that's kind of the, the tread water level. It, you essentially have to pay the cost of the benefits attributed to the current year of service plus interest on the unfunded liability uh, to get there. I like to think of it as a credit card analogy, is when you get your credit, you know, your statement, it's if your purchases, you have your purchases every month and then you have your interest that accrues if you don't pay your credit card off every month, right? You have that interest. And so when you make a payment, it's the amount of that payment that goes towards, you know, chipping away at the, the, the balance on your credit card, the, the principle of that. Okay. Um, all right, let's see here. It, just for <clears throat> for explanation purposes, you do this experience study every two years. The demographic experience study, yes, we do it every two years. So you're doing it for the 2023 evaluation. Next time will be the 2025. Just wanted to make sure that, that was understood. There are other systems that have a larger experience study than two years. Right. So um, we do this every two years because it's in your municipal code to do it every two years. Uh, we would uh, normally recommend a longer period between the experience studies. All right, so uh, you just saw this uh, chart on liability gains and losses, but uh, in, in we do the experience study every two years. In 2021, we did not change very many assumptions. There were just a couple uh, small tweaks. So most of the assumptions have been the same since 2019. And so the chart is showing uh, the gains and losses since the last um, real significant assumption changes. The, um, it, you can see here the green bars are, are clearly the large piece that's contributed to losses over the last four years, and it's really just been the last three. But I want to point out that all of these are relatively small compared to your liability. Uh, your liabilities last year was 5.7 billion, uh, so a 57 million dollar loss would be a 1% uh, loss on the the liabilities. So most of these things are are well with it. In that this last year we had uh, a higher uh, loss than we've had, but particularly just because of those salary increases. But you can also see here some patterns that both uh, terminations shown in red and retirement experience in gold have been uh, consistent sources of losses. They're not uh, huge losses, but they are uh, consistent. We, we would like to see um, some alternating gains and losses if our assumption is, is right on. Uh, on the flip side, the disability, the dark blue, has been a consistent source of gains. Uh, and, and during the period, not too surprisingly, through the pandemic, uh, mortality has been a source of gain. So that, that kind of gives you a hint at where we're going to be going with our assumption recommendations here. Yeah. Chair, do you mind if I ask a quick question? On the salary increases, does that include overtime or no? Uh, it, 
I don't believe so. I think it's just it's pensionable just pay. Okay. And but it does include. Um, I mean, a big part of it was uh, the future increases embedded in the most recent collective bargaining agreements. Right, which will be on heading into negotiations soon. But okay, right. Thank so, you. And also, just one little comment about that: the salary or overtime. So yeah. overtime um, pay; those type of pays are not pensionable, okay. so it wouldn't impact um, you know, the actuarial numbers or contributions by city or um, the plan members. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate that. Just one other question. So salary increases going forward wouldn't impact the unfunded debt liability because we, I mean, it's not from previous losses, right? How, how do I think about the intuition around that? Because going forward. It, so it, yeah, there's a little bit of a blend here um, because it's a actual salaries paid uh, that differ from our assumption go into this. But we also anticipate any salaries that have been negotiated in collective bargaining. And so we get um, an advance uh, recognition of some of those losses when there's bargaining that uh, has salary increases greater than we expect. Because the contributions for those increases haven't come in yet, right? Will come in in future years. So what are you peeving to recognize this? this? This is just on the the benefit side, not the contribution side. So this is saying that because those salaries are coming, are, are now anticipated, we would anticipate paying larger benefits. Got it. Uh, so Ann and I are gonna do some back and forth on this, but I just wanted to, uh, kind of hit the highlights of what we're gonna go through here, that uh, we are recommending some changes to retirement assumptions, termination assumptions, mortality, disability, and administrative expenses. Now, a lot of these are just minor tweaks, um, so we'll go through them uh, fairly quickly, but uh, please uh, interrupt uh, and ask questions as we go through. And just for clarity for the board, we just went through the experience study results, and now we're talking about the assumptions moving forward based on that experience study, is that right? Uh, no, we're gonna no. present the, we did the high level analysis of gains and losses. Okay. Now we're gonna present the actual results from the experience study, okay. focusing on the assumptions that we're recommending changes to. Okay. So the first assumption uh, that we're going to that we're showing here is the merit salary scale. Now this is not the wage inflation or the overall increases uh, that are bargained by um, the bargaining units. This is the merit, like the promotional steps or uh, longevity increases. Um, and so the experience does closely align with uh, what our current assumption is. The current assumption is the. Uh, the green line, which is also blue, it's combined because it's current and proposed, there's no changes. Um, and there are some variations in the first couple years. Uh, it, the actual experience is a little lower, but it was heavily impacted by one year of very low increases. And we're gonna continue to monitor um, this going forward in the future to see if there needs to be any changes. But they're, they're pretty much the d variations are offsetting for the most part. So uh, when we get into things like uh, retirement rates, termination rates, and so forth, uh, we use confidence intervals to assess those assumptions. And so I just wanted to give you an introduction so you know how to read the charts and why we think it's important. Uh, so in a hypothetical case, we may observe a rate of 10%, but that could be one out of 10 people who were eligible for retirement, for example, or it could be 10 out of 100, or 100 out of 1,000. And as you might imagine, if it's one out of 10, we don't really know how much to rely on that one, uh, because two out of 10 is a quite different number than one out of 10. And so we calculate these confidence intervals that take into account the, uh, we call them exposures, but it's, uh, in the case of retirement, it's people who were eligible to retire at that 
age service combination. Uh, and so the gray bars represent the 90% confidence interval. And if there's only 10 people who were eligible, that confidence interval is going to be large because we're indicating we're uncertain about that 10%. Uh, all the way down to if you have 1,000, we're pretty confident that the actual retirement rate is, in this case, somewhere between 8 and 12%. And, and so when we see the actual um, uh, assumption outside of the confidence interval, that causes us to consider a change. We won't always make a change um, because you'll see that the data is kind of bumpy at times, um, but that's really what's driving our recommendations for a change, is if we see something consistently outside the confidence interval. For most of this, we're looking at 10 years of data. Um, we are aware that uh, several years included the pandemic, which may not uh, be what we expect in the future. Uh, so we have looked at that in some cases, uh, made some adjustments or uh, just uh, made some adjustments to take it into account. We also are going to report two other statistics. The actual to expected ratio. So if we expect uh, uh, 100 retirements and there are 102, that actual will be 102% actual to expect it. Uh, or if there are only 98, it'll be 98%. Uh, we use that because we want the assumption to get to 100% or around 100%. Uh, and so most of our changes will be moving that uh, in that direction. The other statistic we'll report is called R squared. And it, it's really when we have uh, multiple assumptions for like multiple ages or service buckets. It's making sure that our pattern fits the pattern of the data. So you could have the assumption av on average correct, but if retirements are going up at older ages, uh, you need to make sure you're matching that pattern as well. So that's what those two go to. We do want the R squared to go towards uh, 100. Um, it, it's much harder to get it to be at 100. So it, we will not be uh, right on 100. So any questions on the, those, or you can raise them as we go through uh, as well. So looking at the retirement rates, we did make um, overall some structural changes to, to how we are setting these retirement rates. And we're looking today at the tier one, because we don't have much experience, if any, for the tier two members yet. So currently, the assumption is age-based. And then it's also service-based, and we have different assumptions for members who are less, who have less than 30 years of service, and different assumptions for members who will have more than 30 years of service. But now we looked at splitting this bucket of below 30 years of service into two pieces, um, between 20 and 24, and 25 to 29, because we did see higher rates of retirement if you have 25 to 29 years of experience. So. We and it's also how the eligibility for retirement is structured for the tier one members. Um, so generally what we did for the service buckets 20 to 24, we didn't change it for the fire. We um, are going to recommend decreasing some of the rates for the uh, police at, at those service groups because their actual to expected ratio is 92, which means 92 actual retirements versus 100 expected, so we're gonna uh, propose reducing those rates a little bit, but for the, the 25 to 29 bucket, we're going to propose um, increasing those rates because we are seeing higher rates than the current assumption. And then those uh, members who have 30 or more years of service, right now we assume 100% of those members are going to retire, but there is, uh, the data supports that that's not necessarily true and we are seeing uh, less than 100% retirement when someone has 30 years of service. And the, here are the uh, graphs showing these confidence intervals. On the left is the fire with 20 to 24 years, and the line represents the current and proposed assumption because we're not changing them. Um, and then for the police, you can see the proposed uh, assumptions are the green line, and we're recommending just a, a slight uh, 
a slight in or decrease in the rates for retirements between ages uh, 58 and 61 for the police tier. And at 62, we assume 100%. Right. 62, we, uh, for um, both police and fire, we assume 100% retirement. Um, the 25 to 29 years, we're proposing increases for both fire and police. You can see the green line is, is uh, above the blue line when the blue line is the current assumption, and it falls more in line with, uh, with the experience and within uh, those confidence intervals as well. <coughs> And then here we're showing 30 or more years of experience. Um, and on the left-hand side, we're uh, proposing a 50% rate of retirement when someone has more than 30 years of 30 or more years of service. Um, and then 100% once they hit age 55. Uh, and you can see on the fire side, the black dots kind of bounce between zero and 100 between ages 56 and 61. It kind of goes up and down and up and down. So we just wanted to be conservative when we're saying, uh, proposing 100% once they reach age uh, 55. And then for the police, um, it's a little bit higher rate of retirement once you know a member hits 30 years of service for them. And so we're going to recommend a slightly higher rate of 60% across the board until they hit 62 and then it's 100% again. I think in, in prior years, we really didn't have much data above 30 years of service, and so we assumed everyone retired when they got to 30 years, which makes some sense given the benefit formulas and stuff, but we are now seeing uh, some people work beyond that. Uh, so the next uh, set of assumptions is the termination rates. These are based on years of service. Uh, just very quickly, the fire uh, termination rates really match up uh, with the current assumption pretty well. The police, uh, though, we've had um, we had a period that were uh, where there were really high termination rates, and the more recent experience is much lower. And so we are. Uh, re recognizing that some of that is from the pandemic years, uh, we are still recommending some reductions in those termination rates. And so you can see here on the left side is the, the fire, uh, and you can see the pattern fits uh, pretty well with the current assumption. For the police, uh, prior to 15 or 14 years of service, the experience tends to be uh, quite a bit lower than the current assumption. And so we're recommending reducing that. Uh, you can see that it's very uneven, so uh, it does bounce around some. Um, but we're taking uh, it, you know, a, a step in reducing those rates. If the current uh, or recent experience continues, we may uh, look at this again with the next study in two years. Uh, and if th that recent experience continues, there may be some additional reductions. So the R square you're running is 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 what? To what? What's the dependent variable? What's the independent variable? The R square. So the the R squared is. Um, In your regression, what's the what are the variables? What's the dependent and what's the independent variable? It, it, it's it's the uh, actual rate versus the expected rate, and the. Um, it, it oh, really okay. it for does that particular assumption. It's nothing yeah. to do with that. In that it. particular, um, so here Understood. you're looking at it at each service point. So it's not uh, the, the R square of the termination rate to the unfunded liability. No. No, okay. It's just a, a head count basis for um, who terminates at those years. Which of, of these variables has the biggest beta, so to speak? Is it the 20 to 25 years retirement? The, um, so the largest, the, so the termination rates do not have a huge impact on our liability. Mm -hmm. um, they, they have some impact though. The retirement rates have a much more significant impact on the, the liability uh, and particularly for members with more years of service, because they obviously have the larger benefits. Ah, okay. But but they probably are the smallest 
in the population as well. Right. Thanks. Just making sure, you know, I'm not sleeping, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, she does ask actually a question, so I yeah, can remember when we did the training. Keep me on my toes. Um, can I bother you to ask you, try to speak closer to the microphones, because sure. people that are either for the recording or if they are listening remotely, it's hard for them. Sometimes you're kind of breaking up. Thank you. Yeah. And you know, if there's something you don't want to miss, it's actuarial <laughs> discussion, so. <laughs> Um, so next, we're looking at the mortality experience over the last 10 years, and um, we are recommending only changing the healthy retiree mortality this year. Um, we've used the same table since 2019, um, and those ADE ratios for the male healthy retirees has decreased each year that we've done the experience study, meaning there are less members dying than we're expecting. Um, and so we are not proposing any changes to the actual table. We're, we have a load to that table currently of 1.002, which means we increase each de or each rate of death by that amount. And we're suggesting just now instead of doing a load to the to the death rate, we're actually going to uh, decrease the death rate by 0 0.972. So that we're going to assume that members at each age are going to live uh, a little bit longer. Um, we're going to use the same factor for males and females. We just don't have as much experience with the female uh, healthy retirees. There's only there were only three deaths in the period versus 133 male deaths. Um, we're not going to change the disabled retirees because their experience was it was pretty close to what we expected for the males. Uh, for beneficiaries, you can see those ADE ratios are, are well above 100%, but we're recommending no change for a couple of reasons. When you look at beneficiaries, um, there is a what's called the widower effect, where once the member or the, their spouse has p passed, that the rate of death for the survivor does go up. And so um, that's what we're seeing here. But we also use that beneficiary table for members who are, are currently receiving a benefit and they have their uh, survivor benefit piece. So we use that mortality for that as well. So we'd prefer to be a little bit conservative with that assumption because we use it not just for the uh, cohort of the current beneficiaries, but the uh, members or the people who may become beneficiaries in the future. So it, just to be clear, our data here is just beneficiaries right. after the member has right. passed. Right. And so we have, we don't have data on the beneficiaries before the, the member passes away. And so it ends up being kind of a, a little bit of a skewed data set. Right. And just to make sure I'm reading it correctly, so the observed rate for the the last two, right, 85, 89, 90 plus, it's actually higher than what we've been using and what we propose to use. Uh, yes, for the yeah. for the older ages, older. and so this is um, actually something that I, I've been seeing in uh, a variety of different cases where the the standard tables are not as uh, steep in terms of increasing the mortality rates the the question is how much of that is driven by covid right. and how much is um it, you know something that should affect the underlying tables uh, the society of actuaries is in the middle of conducting a new massive study of uh, uh, mortality for all public plans and so hopefully we'll get some insight from them on that but uh, that's a, a very good point so uh, it's been almost a decade I think since uh, there were some disability reforms uh, put in place for this system uh, and disability data is um, very thin, meaning there's not a lot of disabilities uh, each year. And so it takes a while for us to be able to really confidently observe any uh, change in the data. 
we feel like this year we have enough to, to definitely say that, uh, and you saw the, the history of gains on, on disability, that disability rates have really come down, primarily at ages 50 plus. Um, we don't know for sure that it's the disability reforms, but it, it seems to uh, track the, the pattern of the data. There is a lag time uh, between when someone becomes disabled and when they're granted the disability. So um, part of the delay is, is addressing that lag time. For this study, we removed the 2022 and 2023 data because it shows very, very low levels of disability, but we believe that's just because things are in process and haven't been uh, uh, recognized yet. So we have significant reductions to disability rates for both fire and police. Uh, the main reductions are after age 50. So you, you can see them on, on this slide. Um, we used to have uh, different assumptions for fire and police, but we're seeing um, the, the rates are very similar, so we have combined them. We, are, uh, we don't have enough data to create our own disability table, so we are borrowing a CalPERS disability table uh, for uh, state police officers and firefighters and uh, making a, a minor adjustment to it. But you can see here the, the blue line shows what our old assumption was and uh, there's very significant difference when you get to age 50 uh, in, in how those rates um, are showing now. Yeah. A quick question on the disability. How does the disability factor into the actuarial science part of it? Because <laughs> my understanding is it, it only impacts the plan if you go on disability prior to, I guess, your el eligibility. Right, depending on your years of service when you're, when you be, so it's both age and years of service when you become disabled. Uh, and so a lot of those disabilities over age 50 were not um, having a significant financial impact to the plan because the benefits were the, paid by the plan were the same, whether it was a service retirement or disabled retirement. So, so I mean, looks, you know, kind of that graph up there, I mean, the data points of just say 50 plus or, I mean, really those are muted because they're really not debiting from the pension system in a negative way because they would be collecting anyways if they just retired. Right, so it, the effect of this change is essentially in our um, valuation, we will be assuming fewer disabilities and more retirements because those people will be um, falling under the retirement uh, assumption instead of the disability assumption. Okay, thanks. And we do value the disabled members with a disabled mortality versus a healthy mortality as well. So there is that small difference as well. Thanks for the explanation. So moving on to the um, administrative expenses, um, we looked at this uh, and had some more data um, and what we're going to do and what we're recommending is changing the structure of this assumption as well to better align with how um, expenses are actually allocated to each tier. Um, and that basically is being done um, based on the proportion of assets each tier has um, where there is specific information to, to delegate it or allocate it to a specific source or group that is done um, by the staff, but overall it's largely done in proportion to the assets. And previously, our current assumption is that we were allocating administrative expenses based on headcount for each of the groups and tiers. And so what this is, does is um, it there's a better allocation uh, to the different groups because of this and there's a little bit of a shift be to um, from tier two to tier one and so the tier two members are going to see a little bit of a decrease in their rates because of this and that more of that uh, is going to be pushed to the city uh, tier one contribution rates and you can see here in the the graph above it shows or the chart above 
shows that as a percentage of assets, these administrative expenses are pretty consistent between tier one and tier two and between police and fire as well. Yeah, so uh, in tier two, the administrative expenses are split 50-50 between members in the city. In tier one, there's a historical rate that the members pay and the city pays the balance. And so this effectively is shifting the total amount of administrative expenses is staying about the same, but it's shifting more of it into the tier one bucket, which reflects what's been happening. Uh, and, and so that will um, shift more of it to the, the city, which is effectively what has happened anyway, because it shows up then as a very tiny, but a contribution to the UAL, which the city pays. So in the end, um, it, it, over the long term, it won't have a dramatic impact, but you'll s see on our um, projections that there is that dynamic. Right, and we're talking, you know, 25 basis points, so something relatively not not significant. Does this, does this include investment expenses? No. No, our assumed rate of return is net of investment expenses. And so we take that out, and so it's just the administrative expense piece. Uh, so here's our uh, estimate of the impacts. Uh, a lot of the changes we're proposing go in opposite directions, and so a lot of it uh, ends up uh, kind of canceling out. And we, we end up with a very slight increase in the actuarial liability and consequently the UAL. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, 0.8 million there. It doesn't really change your funded status. Uh, but then you can see the, the allocations here. There's uh, very little impact to the tier one member rates. They go down just a, a hair. Uh, the tier two member rates uh, go down about 70 basis points. That's really being driven by that administrative expense. Uh, assumption and then the city's rate uh, goes up uh, slightly by 0.3 percent of pay that's uh, really both the administrative expense and then the the 0.8 million in uh, additional UAL that the city would have to pay for so the the contribution uh, total for the city goes up about uh, just under a million So um, this is the first decision we'd like you to make. <laughs> uh, we're asking that you uh, Motion to approve. <laughs> adopt the proposed <laughs> assumptions here. That was easy. Motion Actually, can we go back to slide 11? I just want to make sure I, I saw. Uh, on every slide, there was a proposed change. And I know that you were doing a proposed change for the retirement rate, but I don't know if I saw that on the slide. I think it was slide 11. The proposed changes here are are summarized uh, on this slide, I think. And on slide 11, you can see the difference between the, the green and the blue line. The blue line is at 100% across the top. The green line is the proposed uh, assumption. So it's 50% uh, uh, for ages 50 to 54 for uh, fire. And then for police, it's 60% for ages 50 to 61. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion or a second? A second. Motion, Sunita, second by Santos. Any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that's the first one. All right. Okay, uh, so now we are doing uh, items 3A and 3B uh, from the prior meeting. And um, 
So just a quick review. Uh, we went through the economic assumptions at the prior meeting and uh, introduced the asset smoothing question and the board asked us to uh, come back with uh, impacts of a couple different possibilities. So uh, there's no change to the price inflation or the amortization payment increases. The issues were uh, wage inflation. Uh, we suggested that you consider increasing the ultimate assumption from three to three and a quarter. Um, the board asked to see both of those results. The discount rate, uh, we proposed no change, uh, but the board, but you'll recall the capital market assumptions were, were um, much more optimistic this year, and the board asked to see what it would, what the impact of going to 6.75 would be. And then on the asset smoothing, uh, we proposed uh, a, a reset of asset smoothing, uh, not to market, but to um, just smooth out the pattern of recognitions. And so the board wanted to see the impacts of that with and without. So the wage inflation assumption is, um, is the overall wage increases for the entire group. It's, it's, we talked about the merit and longevity increases, which were, there was no change to that in the demographic um, experience study. Um, and the wage inflation is made up of the price inflation plus that real wage growth. And it's at, the current assumption is 3%. When you compare yourself to other systems in California, on the right-hand <coughs> side of the slide, uh, there are 20 other systems at 3%. So it is the most common in California and also the median wage inflation. However, San Jose, as you know, is one of the higher cost of living areas, uh, which would follow that there would be higher, typically higher wage increases. And if you looked at this last year, would there be any 3.25 or you, you had lemon under 3.25, right? Right. Is that something new this year or? That there's That's no, the 2022 okay. survey. Yep. And we don't have 2023 right. information yet. So on the left-hand side, this chart shows um, national wage inflation data, um, and just focusing on the wage inflation piece here at the bottom, uh, the last five and 10 years, that, uh, that figure is 3.8 for the last 10 years, and a 4.3%, um, again, higher than the 3% uh, assumed wage inflation for your system. And then looking just at your recent wage inflation increases um, from the bargained increases, you can see that those amounts are also higher than the 3%. Um, with our assumption, as Bill had mentioned in the uh, previous presentation, is that we do look at the most bargained, um, most recently bargained amounts. Uh, so for 2023-2024, that's 4%, so we incorporate that into our valuation with that assumption at 4%. Um, and then anything that we don't have, um, anything bargained, we do use that ultimate 3.5%. Uh, three percent th wage inflation. So we are considering asking you to increase that to three point two five percent. I'm not going to go through all these. Just to say, when we went through this, the capital market assumptions increased uh, significantly. You can see the. The change on this slide from 2022 and prior years uh, to what we saw in 2023. Uh, the main thing is uh, whether you think those that change in capital market assumptions is uh, is just a temporary change or if it's going to last. And it's really being driven by the the changes in the interest rates from the Federal Reserve's policy, and we're just ca very cautious about. Uh, any increase to the discount rate because we know how hard it is to reduce the discount rate and the pain that causes. So um, we're suggesting that we at least wait a year, keep it at 6.625 this, this time around, uh, and, and see if, there's, um, if those capital market assumptions uh, appear to be uh, more long-term or if we're gonna get a reversal. Uh, we had had some discussion that uh, if you th think you might increase the discount rate 
uh, either this year or next year that you could coordinate the wage inflation increase with when you do the discount rate. And you, you'll see why when we look at the, the costs here. So before we get to the cost, there's one a couple slides here on um, the asset smoothing, the reset of that. Um, we are proposing just a one-time reset of your asset smoothing to smooth out the pattern of the recognized net uh, gains and losses. Uh, the current net uh, in deferred investment loss is $23 million, which on its own is not that much. But you can see the pattern of those recognitions on the right-hand side of the slide here. And each of those uh, colored, different colored bars represents 20% of the original uh, investment gain or loss that, uh, from, the, from back to 2019 through 2023. And in 2023, the total there represents what is recognized in the 2023 valuation, which is very close to a net zero. But then in 2024, um, you can see that we're going to recognize uh, about $25 million in gains, 2025, $50 million in gains. And then the following year, following the line, the purple line, we recognize $100 million in deferred losses. So there's a significant swing year to year because of the investment returns back in 2021 and 22 and how um, you know there's a huge gain and then a, a large loss uh, year over year and it's best to see that the recognizing the 20% uh, each year you, if you look at the 2023 gain of 63 million dollars that dark uh, green bar uh, that gain of about 12.5 million is recognized each year until 2027 so if uh, you were to approve this, it would only change the actual liability or the actuarial value of assets by about five million dollars. And here we're showing the projection of the actual value of assets on the left, and you can see it's really not that much different between um, each year. But the projected city contribution rates, um, you know, they start they start out about this the same in 2025 and end the same in 2030. But in the middle, you can see where the gold bars represent the reset, and it gradually comes down each year, whereas the current method, you're going to see decreases in the next two years, but then it's going to increase again in 2028. So our reset would just be smoothing out that pattern um, of the, the net deferred gains and losses so that it's, it's recognized evenly over the course of the five years. In a sense, then what we're asking you to do, if you remember the chart from our first um, uh, from our first presentation where it showed each and every year of the gains and losses, basically we would be taking that net deferred loss of 23 million and st having it like a fresh start and recognizing 20% each year for the next five years with no other uh, years of deferred gains and losses. We're just combining it to one base in a sense. So let's put a pin on that one piece um, and we'll, uh, Go ahead and finish your uh, presentation because I do want to later on go through the policy that they have so we know under and understand what change that why they're you're recommending this change. Yeah, and, and I do want to be clear. This is um, this is more of an option. It's right. not going to be actuarially significant either way. But often, um, you know, we don't normally like a pattern where we reduce the contribution knowing that it's going to go up again. Uh, and so we'd rather have a, a regular pattern for that that contribution in terms of really in terms of managing budgets and, and those sorts of things. But from an actuarial standpoint, either method works just fine. I have a few questions. I, I understand the reason you're recommending this. I mean, I guess essentially you start off with actuarial and market value equal this year if you do this. Uh, no, we keep the same difference of twenty-three million. Um, well, it, it's a little bit different. It, we we so changed the the actuarial value would increase by about five million, but uh, it would not equal the market value. Oh, okay. Uh, but we would be recognizing twenty-three million in, in that in differences over the next five years instead of. Uh, instead of the fluctuating, instead of the fluctuating yeah. that adds up to the same 23 million so that I follows a very, 
very different pattern. But I, I have a question. So your this chart, doesn't it assume that your, or is there an assumption in this chart that the realized return for the next f five years is the same as the discount rate? Yes. So then uh, that, that, that never happens. Right. Um, and so by questioning our smoothing, smoothing, are you ending up having an unintended consequence of not having, of again creating fluctuation? It, so any, uh, any gain or loss that happens in the future would follow the same method we've used consistently. And so the, those gains or losses would move these numbers up or down, but it does not change this pattern. So, so what you're maybe, really... Maybe the question is easier on the previous slide. So you're showing this, this blue line uh, or bluish green line going up in 26. Now let's say your realized return, this is a gain, right? 26 is a gain. No, it's a loss. Oh, sorry. Okay. It's the other, the, the axis is opposite. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, sure so let's say we... Prabhu and team knock the ball, knock it out of the ballpark, and we have you know one percent over uh, discount rate this year and next year. That loss will, and we don't make a change. Wouldn't that bump likely come down? No, the bump will still be there. The overall level will change. So you would add uh, five more bars starting in 2024 that would take whatever the gain that was, uh, and recognize 20% of it each year for the next five years. And so that, um, that blue line pattern would, would remain, it would just move up or down. But that's net of all the years, right? The net recognition. So your tw 24 gains could offset, 20% of those would offset a 26 loss. Or 20% divided, no. 80% divided by five. Let, let's just say it was uh, 100 million, okay. right? So 20% of that is 20 million each year. W what it would do is take the net amount in 2024 and move it down by 20 million, the net amount in 2025 and move it down by 20 million, the net amount in 2026 and move it down by 20 million. Same for 27. So you end up with that whole chart moved down by $20 million each year, but the, the pattern of that blue line stays the, the same. So essentially, it's, it's asking for a um, re amortization of the 20, 23 million losses that we would experience this year to be smoothed over the next five. One thing I do want to just maybe perhaps in the interest of time is to, um, because it's there may be further discussion on the smoothing method is for, and it's agendized as two separate um, items, is to first take a motion and vote on the um, economic assumptions and have a separate discussion on the, um, the uh, amortization method. So I think that was on slide. So uh, let's just close with the summary of the impacts yeah. we have. Uh, all the different pieces <laughs> here uh, so that you could uh, study the table. But uh, the first set of columns are no assumption changes. We just adopted the demographic changes, so now you're in that second set of columns. And then uh, if you add the three and a quarter percent wage inflation, you're in that third column. And if you also do the discount rate, you're in the fourth column. And at the, um, you can see none of them changed the funded status that much until you get to the discount rate. That would bump it up to 81. Um, but look at the, the member rates, city rates, and the, the city dollar amount, and you can uh, see the, the different changes. Uh, so increasing <coughs> the wage inflation uh, bumps uh, the contributions up, uh, and then doing the discount rate uh, would bring them down. And then there's about a, a $0.4 million difference uh, between uh, resetting the assets or not. Okay. 
Personally, I don't see a, a, a need to change the discount rate. You know, we were we were slow in bringing it down. There's no reason to be fast in going up. But okay, I'll move to adopt our consultant's recommendation for all these um, yeah, adjustments: price inflation, amortization, wage inflation, discount rate. Uh, amortization, so we are still discussing. Right? No, I'm sorry, the asset smoothing is the one we're going to be yeah, discussing we're next. Not, oh, okay. Does, yeah. does not include so, asset smoothing. So I think you would be recommending no changes to the economic assumptions, correct? Yes. I will second that. <coughs> we have a motion from David Kwan and a second from David Wilson. Any further discussion? Just to clarify, so we're staying at 3% inflation. On the wage yeah. inflation. I, th wage I think that's inflation. reasonable because you've already made the, the new agreement in, okay. Just to be clear on this table, <coughs> that will mean the left-hand side of the table, baseline, no assumption changes. No, it's no. the demographic column. No. Demographic. The demographic wow. columns. Okay, that, the second one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. So it's page 11 is where all the summary is, I think. Correct. Yes. Okay. Without the last one. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Smoothing. Yeah, if, if, if I may. Um, so the board does have a actuarial assumptions and methods policy, which was adapted in uh, 2011. And the, the board's policy uh, addresses what to do in situations of gains and losses. And so um, what, what our policy states is that actual, actuarial gains and losses and plan changes are amortized over a 15 year period, beginning with the evaluation date from which they first arise. And so um, what Chiron is recommending is a one-time departure from our stated policy um, rather than recognizing the losses in, 2020, in 20, 2023 of the 23 million um, losses is rather to smooth out that loss over the next five years. Um, the only thing that w appears to me from a fiduciary standpoint both seem reasonable, um, and it's, but I would advise that it may be more prudent to stay the course for the reasons that Sunita had mentioned. We don't know what our investment gains will be or losses will be in the future. Um, and it's, it's better to r recognize whatever our policy has told us to do in terms of the actual, you know, as, as we go experienced um, loss b based on the, how our policy is written is that we, we are to amortize it over 15 year periods. It would, so this would be making a special exception to our yeah, policy yeah, no for I, the five I years. I, I don't think so because this is, uh, that's the amortization policy. We are not changing the amortization policy. We would only be changing the asset smoothing policy. So it would, and. Um, yeah. Is there something stated about asset smoothing? No, there's actually nothing in, the, well, there is something stated about the smoothing, but it's actually not listed in the, in the uh, Appendix B to our actuarial um, valuation documents that was provided it's to in the uh, It's not in the assumption section, it's in the contribution allocation procedure section. Yeah, I have that. I, I don't see it. The asset smoothing method? No, I see actuarial cost method, asset, act, asset valuation method, and amortization that's method. That's asset valuation right. method is okay, the so smoothing. Okay, so that's the smoothing. Method. I'm confused. Um, What's the difference? Between what? Uh, asset, uh, the amortization and asset smoothing. A so, asset smoothing. So, um, so we use the actuarial value of assets to determine what the UAL is. Mm -hmm. And then the amortization policy tells us how to pay for that UAL. Does that okay, make so sense? Okay, so actually looking at that second section, there is no deviation from the policy. It, it would just require the, the board to do um, a one-time uh, agreement to smooth it, smooth it out for the next five years. The only impact really, I believe, is the, on the volatility of the city. As far as I understand from looking at that slide, is that the city would uh, provide more cash flow up front for, for, for in recognition of that loss. Um, but otherwise, you know, within the next five years, we would get the same amount of uh, so money from okay, the- So asset smoothing basically determines your actuarial value. Yes. Amortization is the, the relationship the between that and unfunded. Is that, is that right? I'm sorry. Right, the amortization is how we pay off what we measure as the unfunded. The asset smoothing affects what we measure Thanks. the unfunded to be. Thank you for keeping me straight, yeah. 
And can I ask if, you know, if future gains or losses moves everything up, <coughs> right, or down, right, what has created this bump? What, what it, the it's the pattern of those last five years. It's really the 2021 followed by 2022 yeah. where we had a huge gain uh, followed by a loss. So we could get the same thing in the future. Then. You could get the same thing okay. in the future if you get the, that right. uh, pattern of investment returns. Okay. So if we were to experience more volatility of return versus, uh, versus the discount rate in the future, we would... Would we have another one of these discussions again? You, you could, um, but fixing this one does not yeah. uh, affect it's, it's the, like the dynamics of the you're, future one. You're, we're talking about smoothing the asset returns over a five-year period, but we're saying this may, that may not be smooth enough, and we're incorporating a more ad hoc piece into it to smooth it out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Is that right? uh, but Is that in, in particular, because we had uh, a gain followed by a yeah. loss. So uh, it's not I like- I mean, that pattern couldn't happen again. Right? Yeah, and, and that both were significant. Right. And, I, and, and really, in my mind, the most impactful aspect of this is the contribution rate made by the city. That's You're trying right. to smooth that out instead of having right. very volatile swings in the contribution rate, which may, I don't know, may be it, not it, acceptable so, to so Yeah, that's exactly entities. right. That's the fundamental question. And, it, and, you know, as I said, actuarially, either one works out just fine. It, it's really, do you want, right. are you okay with the pattern where the city's contribution goes down and then back up? Uh, or do you want to smooth it out? Mm -hmm. And that's really what so it boils down to. It's almost like trying to... to um, Guess what the city prefers? <laughs> <laughs> I think they prefer, uh, speaking from a person who gets employed by the city and <laughs> relies on their budget, I think they would prefer something that was uh, much more manageable, um, dropping down 2% and going back up 2% and drop down 2% again is significant and would affect budget and operations, raises, everything in the city, uh, whereas if, they, if you step it down incrementally, um, it would be much easier to manage, just to layman's point of view. You know, I, if I weigh in just a little bit, I, I um, the one-time smoothing makes sense in that the numbers are coming down incrementally, but, uh, and knowing what our budget situation is coming up next year, not in this effect, but we're also negotiating with police and fire in the next year. We're starting uh, police, I think, or fire soon, and then police, which could generate higher um, wages. Well, I hope so, thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that publicly. <laughs> it, it's never, it's ten, never lower, let's, it's let's, always higher. Potentially. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm torn because the reducing the unfunded quicker, but then it steps back up. Is that a bad benefit to the city? I don't know. I, I don't think from my perspective as a city council member, it matters much. I wish Jim Shannon was here, our budget guy who could tell me which he thinks is a better uh, idea, but I'm sure they're estimating worst case as far as expenses for the UAL. But as you said, Dave, any the unfunded liability affects our budget and our affects our services that we and our hiring capabilities. So I don't I don't have a strong pre preference either way. You know, I'd probably defer to your consultant. I would I would probably say it's doing this for a while that Consistency for the city's budget is probably more favorable because they have a better opportunity to plan. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to speak for Jim, of course. <coughs> and if you're listening, I apologize. But I do, I have had discussions with him in the past. And from the budget standpoint, it, it is helpful to understand that percentages are going to be consistently over time, so it makes it easier for them to plan ahead 
um, as opposed to having a, a drop of the next couple of years and God knows what the budget is going to look like in 27 and having to pay all of a sudden more, right? So from a um, budget standpoint, I am confident when I say that they will prefer to have something, numbers that are more consistent, especially when it suggests assuming everything else equal, right? All the assumptions are met that at least percentage-wise, is expected to slow down incrementally over the next couple of years. So I, I, I think that that is correct. I do want to mention, because there were some questions and comments, especially by Trustee Kwan, in terms of the volatility. Um, the, the whole concept, if I misspeak, correct me, because you are the actor and I'm not. I'm just playing one on TV. Um, the whole concept of the, uh, uh, the smoothing process is to actually deal with that volatility and make it more even keel. It's just that we do have in the asset smoothing, we have years where we have gains and losses. It's just that we have two years um, next to each other. The, the, the loss was sizable, uh, but I would say it's still within historic, historical uh, returns, but the gain was astronomical. So that may for a huge gap that we don't usually see in those years. So sure, we, we can see situations in the future where this is going to continue happening, but um, I, will, I will assume, um, unless Prabhu promised me otherwise, we won't be seeing 30 and 35% gains and losses in the next uh, you know, few years, followed by a 10% loss. So uh, I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. In some sense, the, oh, sorry. Um, well, we made an initial assumption about what smoothing period you want to take. If probably, I don't know when, five years. I don't know some people may use more or less, probably more. And so having another process to modify that to smooth out further, I, I personally don't have an issue with it. Just want to express my personal opinion. Hey, that's oh, okay. Go ahead, Harvey. Oh, thank you. Uh, the question, has anyone assessed from the plan's perspective whether either of these patterns will have an impact on our liquidity and cash flow needs in the years that are expected? I, I, look, at, I look at more, I, I, I'm not so interested in the cosmetics of making it look smooth. I'm more interested in knowing whether or not it has any impact on our cash flow and the, uh, the contributions that will be coming in and what we need to pay payroll on a monthly basis. Well, so, so um, um, it, the, the smooth pattern shows you what the impact would be on the net cash flow because you'd have, in the gold bars, you'd have more uh, contributions coming in for those first couple of years. Uh, and, and so that would, uh, increase the net cash flow to the, the system during those years. Um, but I know uh, Jay Kwan gets data from us every year to look at the liquidity needs and, and manage those those cash flows. The a 2 3% difference in the contribution rate is probably not a, a hugely significant change in your net cash flow. Okay, thank you. I just thought that should be part of our record in making this decision. Should we be considering a different smoothing policy, as David what? suggested? Consider what? Is this because we have too short a horizon? It, no, no, no. The, this is just, <laughs> it's an unusual situation where you had a spectacular year followed by a significant loss. It wasn't as significant as your, your gain, but it, it's the juxtaposition of those two I investment years. And regardless of what policy we had, we'd have some dynamic from that. that that's typical and of markets. 2008-9 was disastrous, and then 2010 was a big recovery, so... I don't know how we avoid that. Uh, I, well, and there's no, you don't try and avoid that. You just start managing the, the impacts on contributions. In 2008-9, it came in the opposite order, and so it helped us actually build the ramp up of contributions. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I belong to the camp that a consistent methodology over time is, since we're anyway looking at long horizons, is better than, I think there are unintended consequences of trying to tweak these things. We already have the amortization policy, we have the smoothing policy. 2% doesn't make a difference to the city or us, but I, I you know, that's sort of my bias, but. Like I said, both, of, both approaches are reasonable from a fiduciary standpoint. The pros and cons, as laid out here, is the pro is that we get additional liquidity coming in for the first few years because the contribution rates would be higher. The con would be to the city would be more volatile for the next five years in terms of their contribution rates for their planning purposes. And so my recommendation would be to smooth for the board just by looking at it. I mean, either way, both are reasonable. Um, but that, that would be my position. I'll make a motion to accept Chiron's recommendation to reset the smoothing for the one time. Second. I second that. I had a motion from Dave Wilson, second from Santos. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I oppose. Okay, so Cindy opposes. All right. Um, the next is uh, our uh, OPEB assumptions. Oh dear. Just a moment here. Um, joining me is going to be Mike Shunning, who is uh, joining via Zoom. He's our healthcare actuary. And I apologize, let me, apparently closed it. <laughs> So Mike, are you there? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so just since we're shifting from pension to OPEB, just a quick brief background. The, the OPEB plan, the retiree medical plan, it's mostly closed. So there are only tier one members who did not elect to go to the VIVA are, are getting full benefits. So uh, it's mostly a declining uh, population. Uh, people who are not in that group uh, can qualify for catastrophic disability benefits, but that is a tiny part of the liability. Uh, member contributions are fixed, so whatever we do does not affect uh, member contributions. They're just 8% of pay. Uh, and it's the city that city contributions that we set. The city has the option to cap contributions at 11% of pay. We've exceeded that 11% by small amounts, and the city has not uh, invoked the cap. But that is something that they can do. Um, and like with the pension, this valuation would develop the contributions for fiscal year end 2025. Um, the other difference with the OPEB plan uh, is that there are really two kinds of subsidies provided. There's the explicit subsidy where the plan pays the premium for the health coverage selected by the retiree up to 100% of the premium for the lowest cost plan offered to active employees. That's the portion of the benefit that is pre-funded and that this board addresses. There's also an additional obligation from having a retiree medical plan that uh, that we have to disclose in the report and, and in particular in the the GASB uh, report that's the implicit subsidy and so that's paid on a pay-as-you-go basis it's not part of our pre-funding but it, it's uh, when you are providing health care benefits to uh, people, it, the cost of those benefits varies by age. Uh, older <coughs> people tend to have higher health care costs than younger people. The premiums are set essentially as an average for the whole group. 
And so when you're just looking at the retiree group, pre-65, uh, there's an implicit subsidy because the cost of their health care is generally greater than the premium that's being charged, just because they're an older population. That uh, gets captured in this implicit subsidy. It's in your report, um, but we're, we're not pre-funding it, so uh, it, it's an important piece to understand for the total costs of providing this benefit, uh, but it's not part of the pre-funding package. We updated uh, the projections we provided in the valuation for the investment returns, and so I think the quickest way to look at this is uh, on the right-hand chart, the contributions. The blue line represents what we projected from the last valuation. Updating the assets for the actual investment returns, you get the gold bars. They look pretty similar. Um, that's that's where we are. The investment returns were close to the assumption, not, not identical. So with that, uh, um, oh, let me do one or two more charts, and then I'll turn it to Mike. Uh, many of the assumptions we use the same as the pension plan, so we don't have to address those, but uh, the demographic assumptions you adopted today will also be used in the OPEV valuation. And the uh, economic assumptions that didn't change. Um, but we have some specific assumptions uh, for OPEB that, that are independent, uh, including the discount rate because it's a different asset allocation. So just uh, hitting the highlights here, we are recommending a couple changes to the healthcare trend rates and the plan elections uh, and then the administrative expenses. Uh, no changes to many of the other assumptions. Uh, we aren't going to go through the assumptions that we're not recommending changes for, except uh, just to touch the discount rate again. Okay, Mike. Okay, so this first chart shows the change in the explicit subsidy. So this is what the city's contribution is actually based on. And from the last evaluation, we actually expected it to go up by 7.16%. It actually went up by t a little bit over 10%. And basically all the pre-Medicare plans receive this Medicare, this uh, maximum subsidy because it's based on the lowest cost plan. So anybody that takes anything but that lowest cost plan, which is the Kaiser high deductible plan, basically you're going to pay the that's additional increase. For the Medicare eligibles, again, it's still based on that active premium. They're all still, the premiums are lower than that maximum subsidy, but the amount that is going to hit the liability is a lot higher because, again, we expected an increase of 4.3%, and the actual increase for Kaiser was 16.3%, and then for the Anthem PPO, it was 3%. So kind of you average that together, you're right around 9%. And to put that in context, that is what we've been seeing. If you look at what CalPERS has seen, CalPERS saw an increase in their pre-Medicare plans of 11%, and the average increase for their Medicare-eligible plans were 9.5%. We've been seeing these increases overall. It's just the impact of inflation hitting the plans now that we're probably going to see higher increases for the next few years. So the next slide goes into this kind of gives you kind of a historical comparison of where trends have been and this is just through 2022 so again we don't have any 2023 or 2024 information yet because that hasn't been published but you can see we use the Kaiser Family Foundation for the pre-Medicare piece which is a survey Kaiser the foundation has been doing for the last probably 30 years so it's a fairly consistent group of employers over time and you can see that that actually has been trending fairly well at about 5.3%. And last year it was actually really positive, but we expect it to start hitting the levels that you actually saw back in the early 2000s, where we're going to start to see double-digit trends for a few years. And then you can really start to see the increase in the Medicare side that historically it was at 3.5%, but you look at the last two years, it's been almost 6% a year. It's been trending that way for 23 and going into 24. So the next slide. 
is kind of developing our trend rates. And we basically use a model that's been developed by the Society of Actuaries where we set the initial short-term trends. So again, we expect the non-Medicare eligibles to still be around the 10% short-term and the Medicare eligibles at six. And then adjust downwards to a longer term trend of just over 5% by 2023, which is really kind of a nominal per capita GP, uh, GDP growth plus 1% medical excess costs. Because again, medical costs still are increasing at a rate slightly faster than what the general rate of our gross domestic product increasing. But then it grades down to the fact that that can't happen forever. Otherwise, Healthcare takes up 100% of our economy. That does grade down to, it's essentially just increases with GDP growth over time. So it hits 3.94% by 2075. And basically still keeping dental at 3.5% for all years because dental has been fairly flat and it always has been. So next slide. This one shows kind of between the 2023 and 2022 assumptions. The chart on the left is the non-Medicare eligible trend. And you see the big difference is the short-term trends are higher, but then the longer-term trends are a little bit lower and they end about the same point. So kind of overall, this is probably gonna have a nominal aggregate effect, but it does increase things a lot the first year. So you basically get slightly lower trends in the succeeding years. And you see a very similar pattern with the Medicare eligible trends where it's going to be somewhat higher in the early years, but that actually falls a little bit lower and then trends down to the final same ultimate rate over the essentially 50 year time frame. So next slide. It's plan election. So the other assumption we have to make is where do we think future retirees or the current actives who retire, which plans will they choose? And we basically always monitor this and we look at what's happened recently. And in 2023, the elections did differ somewhat and are kind of trending in the motion that we're actually seeing more people take the Kaiser deductible HMO plan, which is the low cost plan, because they don't want to pay that additional amount in premium. And we also then saw some increases in the same thing for Anthem. So basically people taking the high deductible health plan on the PPO side or the deductible HMO plan, again, for the cheaper plan. And particularly on the PPO side, a lot less people taking those higher cost PPO plans. So we're recommending changes to really reflect that. The other change is there's just a really slight change in the Medicare eligible plans, mainly because the Anthem Medicare HMO is no longer being offered. So we're assuming all of those people will join the PPO plan because again, if you're in the Anthem plan, it's because you don't want to be in Kaiser. So the odds of those people wanting to move to Kaiser is pretty minimal. So we're assuming they're all going to go into the Anthem Medicare PPO plan. And again, no change in the dental plans that has been consistent for years that most people want the PPO, they don't want the dental HMO. So, so uh, uh, we have, we have a separate, a separate administrative, administrative expense assumption for this plan. Uh, we're, we set it on a per capita basis. The current assumption would be a little over $43 per person. What we've seen though is uh, since we've gotten through the implementation of the VEBA and all the changes that affected this plan, the administrative costs have gone down. So we're recommending a reduction uh, to the administrative costs assumption uh, down to 35 for fiscal year end 2025 it'd be 35 dollars per member we increase it with the the wage inflation assumption each year after that for any projections and then we have a similar dynamic that we saw on the pension plan with the capital market assumptions being much higher and so uh, providing similar data here but uh, also a similar recommendation that uh, we hold the assumption this year at 6%. So uh, I, I know we've exhausted you with uh, actuarial assumptions, so uh, just want to 
wrap it up and, uh, and ask for the adoption of these OPEB assumptions as described here. Anybody have any questions? Nope, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Motion Santos. Second Gardner. Second Gardner. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you very much and thank you for your patience. Thank you for a very good presentation. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much, much Ann and Phil. Thank you. to 3C, discussion and possible action on 2023 Police and Fire Board Self-Assessment Evaluation. Who's doing that one? I have to apologize. I didn't attend the agenda review, so I'm not sure. This should be Walter from Cortex. Walter, I just have a communication with Walter. He didn't request this item to be added. I oh, know was there was a, a discussion. Right. I so thought it was federated that they did the self evaluation, no police and fire. Was it police and fire? No, we had a real police and fire, and then we had him to come back with some recommendations of how to implement. So we discussed this at a prior meeting. Yes. Okay. There is a memo. I am not aware that he was. Um, perhaps we can go to another item while I, uh, I'll, I'll check yeah. with Walter and see if he, he can speak yeah, to I'm it. Oh. I apologize, Walter. Um, yeah, no, I, I was not aware this was on the agenda. I apologize. So I, I don't, I think there was a follow up. There was a request and a discussion that staff complete the survey. Um, and just to confirm that they uh, were going to do that, and I can send the survey link to the three staff members that we talked about and uh, then feedback next meeting the results if that's what the committee wishes. So let's look so for this item. Yeah. Okay. We will defer 3C. Now we have 3D, discussion and action on merit increase in executive days for the CEO position. I think for our conversation, I'll entertain a motion to defer that. So moved. Motion Second Santos, Wilson. second by Dave Wilson. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. That's uh, over to you, Roberto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so a couple of items, I want to let you know that we kick off the month of November, uh, which is the open enrollment for healthcare for retirees. Uh, the enrollment packets uh, have been mailed and there is an in-person health fair scheduled for uh, next week, November 8th at the Lanning Center from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, in addition to that, there are gonna be multiple opportunities for members to attend uh, virtual online webinars and one-on-one -on -one consultations time with the vendors. Um, in addition to that, uh, there is a team of staff from ORS that will be, um, from the health team, that will be uh, providing a presentation on an open enrollment process on November 9th to the Association of Retired San Jose Police Officers and Firefighters. Um, the Retirement Connection Newsletter Fall Edition was distributed early this month. You should have received it by now. Um, Prabhu uh, alluded to this in his report. He will be in front of the City Council uh, Tuesday, November 14th to present the annual investments fee report. Uh, this will be for calendar year 2022. Um, on last Tuesday, uh, there was a discussion. The city auditor presented their interim audit report on the alignment of controls between the city and the Office of Retirement Services. Uh, again, that presentation took place to the city council. Um, I 
Barbara attended in person and so did your uh, fiduciary council, Maytag, uh, attended the meeting. I attended remotely and uh, there was a requirement request by the council um, that we be back in front of the city council uh, within 45 days to provide an update on the work associated with the project uh, for which uh, the board's higher cortex to work with staff on filling those gaps related to um, policies and procedures uh, with the city. I don't know, Maytag, if you want to add any other comments. Sure. So I, I do have an agenda item to discuss that very issue. So we'll, I'll defer that conversation to that agenda item. Very well. Thank you. And lastly, uh, our office uh, will be closed a couple of uh, few days this month, first on November 10th uh, for Veterans Day, and again November 23rd and 24th for the Thanksgiving holiday. That concludes my comments, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we are all update from Council Liaison. Been a long meeting. I appreciate that, and I I just wanted to make a comment about the audit that we had performed recently. The auditor Joe Royce uh, was responding to a request by myself and Councilmember Davis, who is the liaison to the Federated Board and the Mayor as well, to do an audit based on the Cortex audit. Uh, we were concerned about several issues: procurement, HR. <coughs> Um, cybersecurity, several other issues. And I would encourage you, if you haven't read the report, this is an interim report. There's going to be another report coming out. I don't know when. But I would encourage you, if you haven't read it yet, that you should read it. It's a public document. It's very uh, informational as it relates to the analysis of the plan, both the rights and responsibilities of you as trustees and we as city council. Um, I just want to say, and, and I have some comments when you get to the later report uh, briefly, but I just want to uh, acknowledge that I wear a different hat than you when I'm at these meetings. I represent the city of San Jose. I represent a million residents. I am one of 11 colleagues who vote on issues and policies that affect the city and the taxpayers and our budget. So. I look at these things slightly differently than you do, which is my responsibility. You have your, your responsibility as trustee. So I look forward to a, a longer discussion about that, but I just wanted to acknowledge that the purpose is not to say you're doing things right or wrong. The purpose is to build a tighter organization to hold accountable for all the monies that come into your into the uh, retirement services and how they're then managed by you and then the city, what liability we, we may have or don't have. Um, so I'll leave it with that. I don't have anything else to say other than uh, it's been an uh, interesting council year with six new people in their positions and elections coming and, and bargaining finish with most of our units, but starting up with the police and fire uh, units coming up soon. With that, I'll take any questions if you have them. Okay, seeing no questions, we'll move on. Discussion and action on the 2024 scheduled board and standing committee meetings. So I just wanted to make one comment about that. So the back of materials um, provided with the, the schedule did mention that all the meetings would be held by AB1, AB361, which is not going to be the case anymore since that has since been uh, rep not repealed, but there's no uh, declaration of emergency from the uh, governor. So with that caveat with the backup memo, um, I it's leave it up for the board to whether or not to adopt uh -huh. as stated in the memo. And I do want to uh, mention this is um, a document that is prepared every year by staff. Uh, I think the key issue here is to know that uh, the, m the bulk of the meetings that are indicated here are your board meetings, which are scheduled the first Thursday of every month, uh, except for the month of July. And then, of course, there are um, 
suggest the committee meeting dates for the audit, risk, governance, and disability throughout the year. Um, this is your chance to ask questions, uh, suggest changes. Um, you, you're not able to change when the board meetings take place, the day, uh, because that's uh, in the mini so it's the first Thursday of every month. That doesn't change that a special meeting could always be called if needed. But again, this is for you to uh, uh, ask any questions and then we can always come back next month if there are any suggested changes uh, for your approval. Uh, I don't know if, if anyone from staff, besides the comments by council, if anyone has any other comments. Um, I've, I've already emailed Roberto, but one is, I think last year I'd asked if the board meeting could start at 9 instead of 8.30. Uh, I, I think he was, he's going to check on the Muni code and come back. Uh, I'm sorry, yes. We did check. The Muni code only requires that they are the first Thursday. It doesn't really address the start time. That's certainly, it, it has been 8.30 since I joined you board, but I leave, it, I leave that up to the board for discussion. doesn't make a difference to me. No. Oh, okay. And then I had one other uh, suggestion. Uh, I mean, I, I, currently I'm the chair of the audit committee. Uh, the the I'd issue. I'd like you to stay on it. It's a lot of work. That's going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get to the <laughs> but, um, but I think what is uh, complicated about that is is it's been scheduled for after the, the uh, federated board meeting and then the start time becomes very ambiguous and so I don't know if Dave or Howard you feel strongly but I just thought we should have a fixed start time I don't know it'd be easier with fixed start time I'd be honest I'm right up the street I'm probably not the one to make that decision because oh, okay. it's easy for me both to of us, uh, is, uh, the, is the reason that it's those are joint meetings is that right that's why we yeah. have them right after yeah it, it's hard to have a fixed start time because it cannot or it should not start until the actual Fed board meeting ends. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's a suggested time. Uh, I think it's 12.30, but we, from time to time, we don't know. Uh, some meetings may end at 11, some may end at 2, so that's why we don't, we do have a fixed day, but not the start time is a little more difficult. So is there anything that says it has to follow Federated's meeting? Can it be on an off day? It, it can be an off day. That's why we have a new discussion. What we have learned is that it's harder for many of you to dedicate different dates to the meetings. Uh, the only meeting that actually has been scheduled on a separate day than the board meetings are investment committee meetings because typically not as much these days, even though I'm looking at Jay, um, typically they don't, they last longer than the other committee meetings, except for, of course, this year, the other committee. So uh, therefore, they have always been scheduled um, after board meetings because it's harder for a trustee to be available two or three days a week than one. Can, can we uh, schedule them after? Um, I guess you have public members on both, but uh, I thought maybe there are more employees on the the audit committee, but if you said you schedule it after our board meetings, is that a possibility because many of the employees are nearby? Th that's a possibility. I suspect I'm going to get the same request by the other side of the door, which is uh, can you can we actually schedule them after the Fed meeting? Um, I don't, I leave it up to you. You are my bosses, but we try to, I don't want to speak for staff here, but we try to. Um, obviously, as you see, some of them are scheduled after your board meeting, and some of, I don't mean your audit committee, some of the committee meetings are scheduled after oh. police and fire, some others are scheduled after federated. Barbara, I don't know if you want to add anything to it. You don't have to if you don't want to. No, I'm just listening, and um, obviously we could go back and, and see if we could identify, uh, you know, a day that's not after either um, police and fire or fed if, if the desire is to have a, a particular start date I mean we could explore that um, we could um, I, I'm not opposed to doing that again uh, it's been the experience that especially for public members it's harder for them to be more available more than one time 
then of course you have to also keep in mind that <coughs> every board has a meeting a month. So if you're gonna schedule a meeting, it, it probably shouldn't be the same week as one of the board meetings, so it has to be in the week in between. And I'm of course, thinking. that also impact the work that the staff have to do yeah. because in between, what we're doing is putting together the board meetings. And uh, the audit agenda. committee is quarterly. So it's once it, every three it, The months? audit committee is quarterly. Uh, they go this, all these uh, assume that these meetings are quarterly except for uh, disability for police and fire, which are usually monthly, and your board meetings. And JPC. Uh, how about we keep it, on the, keep it there, but we um, don't meet before 12.30. If, if the federal board meeting ends early, then they have to wait. And if it's running late, we get a message and we can come a little later. I'm sorry, so you said not that's to make it before 12.30? Yeah, like, so if, if the federal mo meeting ends early, that's too bad. They just have to wait. Oh, that, that's, that works for you, but, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I certainly understand where you're coming from. Uh, what we try to do, uh, uh, Trustee Ganapati, is to put language in the board's agenda that allow us to start a committee meeting uh, somewhat immediately after the board meeting ends so that if we say 12.30 and a meeting <laughs> ends at 11, you don't have trustees sitting there 90 minutes waiting for the committee meeting, even though it will require someone that is not there to try to be there early. Yeah, that's, that's what okay. we try to text. And so I completely understand where, where you're coming from. By the same token, if the meeting lasts longer than 12.30, then um, obviously you will be here early, but then the after that meeting is over for the board, then they will have the joint committee. Um, I'm not opposed to that approach. Um, the, the challenge is, it's hard for me to ask trustees if a meeting ends really early to wait 90 minutes because they, they especially if you're from the public, you're just sitting there doing nothing. So it, it has been my experience, and I don't want to speak for you, that it's easier for us to keep track of how the meeting is going so we can text those trustees that are coming later, hey, the meeting is running uh, uh, shorter, you may want to try to be here earlier than the particular time, so that's all. if I just let it ch jump in, so this is kind of related to the Brown Act. The Brown Act requires us to post a time certain and the location certain of where the meeting would take place. But I hear you, we, we could make it the agenda state that it would be scheduled. I, I believe in our previous audit committee, joint audit committee agendas, it said 11.30 or 12 or something like that, or soon after the federated meeting. We could change it to 12.30 or shortly thereafter from the federated meeting. So if the federated meeting goes longer, then 12.30, then the, the, the notice could um, take that into account. Is that what you're trying to get at? I'm, I'm just, just trying to make sure I understand it, the I get concern. messages saying the meeting is running early. Can you come early? She, uh, she's actually work. more concerned about when the meeting oh. is early. So I think we should say 12.30 start time unless the federated meeting runs longer. If the federated meeting is longer, then the audit committee will wait for that. But yes. Yeah, actually, the memo okay. already states 12.30 to 2.30 unless otherwise noted. So. Okay. It already has the 12.30 on the middle. Okay, but I think by practice, it, I've gone I understand yeah. by practice. Yeah, um, so, but yeah, that's they're, fine. They're, they're, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, this is a discussion in action. <coughs> I'll make the motion to accept the memo with this, uh, stated changes of removing AB 361, moving the start time to 9 o'clock, and then uh, I think audit risk the way it reads this addresses what you wanted. Second. Okay, we've got a motion from Dave Wilson, <coughs> second from Sunita. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, moving on. Okay, so this is an item that I have here um, that to be heard. This is item 4D, which I am requesting to also be heard along with um, uh, 4J. And so I'm going to start off first with the item 4D. So as you know, and as our Councilwoman Foley has mentioned, the City Auditor issued its interim report on the alignment and controls between between the city and ORS. It is my understanding that this report was sent to all the board members directly. Um, although ORS is a city department, it is unique in the fact that it exists solely to assist this independent board as fiduciaries in the plan administration on a day-to-day -day basis. But this, 
ORS is staffed by city employees and uses a lot of the city's systems, for example, IT, payroll, and email. And so with this agenda item, I do have a, a memo um, that outlines the authorities of this board under the California Constitution, the city charter, the San Jose, and the San Jose Municipal Code. And so the reason why I provided the, this memo is because there's a lot of discussion and I think a lot of confusions around what Measure G means and what the board's independence really is under the code. And so what I wanted to do is to provide this memo to provide the legal landscape of where our authority lies, both under the Can California Constitution, the city charter, and the San Jose Municipal Code. Now, as fiduciary counsel, I have reviewed the um, city auditor's report and I agree with much of the report that um, it that states, and I hope this memo will also help clarify for the board to understand um, what our authority is vis-a-vis -vis the city, um, so that the board can map out its or uh, and understand and exercise its independent um, authority and where it's pre and decide where it's prudent to follow the city policies for both the board and the city to have clarity and to figure out where those gray areas are. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the, this board is governed by a mosaic of law, so it's under the California Constitution and the city charter and the municipal code. So now let's start first with the California Constitution. Under the California Constitution, this board is given the sole and exclusive authority over actuarial um, issues. <coughs> we, we are charged with the duty to ensure that the plan has competent assets and is actuarially sound. We also are charged with the exclusive independent authority to administer benefits under the Constitution. No one else is charged with that fiduciary duty to pay out the, the timely payment of benefits to our retirees and beneficiaries other than us. Uh, another area where the Constitution grants us uh, exclusive and sole authority is on the investment of our assets. That makes sense because we are charged with making sure the fund has enough money to pay out the benefits now and in the future. And one of those funding streams is our investments. And lastly, the plan also the Constitution also provides the you as a board um, the sole and exclusive duty for the administration of the plan in light of your fiduciary considerations that are outlined in the California Constitution. Now, these duties of this board um, are exclusive to the board and require the board to maintain its independence. So I d wanted to just put that out there. This is something as a retirement board under the Constitution cannot be taken away and things that we would need to st stand steadfast on in terms of exercising our independence. Now, the city charter does recognize the, Cal the California constitutional independence and duties, the few that I've just stated, um, but largely addresses uh, personnel and budget issues. And this is exactly where um, Measure G fits in. Measure G was a, uh, a ballot initiative that amended the city charter to provide um, this board a direct line of reporting to the CIO and the CEO. And, that, and from there, the CEO then has its own authority to decide what the personnel issues are. Now, through the city charter, it does also um, reserve a lot of authority back to the city, especially on budgeting issues. So while we, for example, if we wanted to address with the city auditor's report to have a um, compliance officer position created, we can certainly do that, but we would have to look to the city to get the funding to fund that, that position before we can go out to the market and decide whether or not that would be a prudent um, position to get. So just putting that all in context of who's, whose authority stands where. Now, the San Jose Municipal Code then also supplements the board's constitutional authorities, particularly in two areas that I want to call your attention to. One of them is in contracting. So one of the issues under the, uh, the San Jose Municipal Code is that any contract entered for the administration of this plan has to be entered in the name of the board. It cannot be entered in the name of the city. So we, we are responsible for all the contracts that we enter, including the timely payments on services rendered. Another um, important feature for the board's consideration is the, cus the custodying of our fund. So in, in, in our situation, we have two custodians. We have the one custodian is our BNY Mellon custodian who custodies most of our investment funds. We also have the city's finance director that is um, custodying uh, the remainder of our funds. And, and that's where, so we have two custodians. Nothing in the Muni Code requires us to custody 
money with the city and nothing requires us to custody our money with BNY Mellon or any other you know, commercial custodian um, services. So these are a few decision points I think I would highlight in the, in the San Jose Municipal Code. Now the, the memo that I provided is much more detailed um, and I encourage everyone to read through it. One of the, an, another area I would like to highlight it, that was both recognized by the city auditor as well as um, in the Muni Code and in my memo is that this board has rulemaking authority. We have the authority to make regulations and rules for the administration of our plan consistent with the law. Um, another thing I want to mention here, so this is, so that was talking about the legal memo, and now I'm going to switch over to the, um, the, one second, the recommendation under 4J, if you can please pull up that, uh, that, I, the backup material for that one. So as you do that, um, as some of you know and are aware, the city auditor presented its report to the city council and the mayor issued a letter in response. I appeared before city council uh, last week as fiduciary council for this plan and commented on the mayor's letter to make sure that we are addressing the issues raised in the audit and exercising our independence authority to do so. The mayor directed the boards, as Roberta mentioned, and ORS to report back within 45 days on the progress made in terms of de deciding and um, developing our own policies. Um, the mayor had asked the board to adopt the city's policies, um, as stated in the letter, and, but the city auditor's finding also included that the board could exercise its discretion and authority to adopt policies of its own. So with that, um, I've provided this backup material. So what I did was that um, I went through all the bodies of law and I went through the city's policy. And in my judgment, these are the proposals I think fall within the legal realm um, for the, the board to adopt because there are some instances where the board should absolutely adopt and, and exercise their independence from the plan sponsor, which is the city. But there are also instances where it's more prudent to follow the city policies, given that ORS is a city department staffed by city employees. And so after consideration of the law governing the board's authority, practical considerations and my review of the city policies, I present to the board my assessment of where I believe it's prudent for the board to adopt city policies. So if we go through the backup materials here, you'll see um, with chapter 1.1, fair employment, I recommend that or the board adopt all those policies for uh, ORS's operations. Is there any questions on that? Okay, um, chapter one, one. One question. Sure. Um, just of the ones that you list in this document, do you see any that would be a, a challenge to work through that are not, you know, not with this, not adopting the city? Well, so there's there may be a few, and those would be subject to the, the governance committee and the board to adopt. One of them would maybe around the COVID policies. Um, for example, I think it's, I have to look closer at the ex exact policies to find the details on it, but I believe some of the COVID policies require vaccinations for everyone for them mm -hmm. to continue oper working. Um, so I think that's one of them where we may disagree. Um, but you, again, we also, not saying we will disagree, that's the thing. So these are just areas warranting further um, communication with the city, further thought from our boards. Um, that I'm raising within my comments right now. I just wanna make sure that's clear for everybody. These are just things that I'm raising for further consideration. Mm -hmm. So that being one. Um, another area would be uh, to, would be policy for employee travel. Um, we may wanna provide a, a stricter policy on employee travel. So for example, if the city's policy requires us to spend more than it would otherwise require us to spend to send someone somewhere. So uh, I believe, and somebody can correct me if I'm incorrect here, is that some of the city policy requires us to fly out of San Jose, where sometimes those flights could be expensive depending on where the destination is. It may be cheaper to fly from SFO. And so because those funds are gonna be taken out of our, um, our, our administrative budget, it would be, we would have a more restrictive um, provision where it says, if there's a cheaper option, please use the cheaper option. Again, not set in stone, I'm just giving mm -hmm. an example of where, where that might come, come up. 
Um, another area, a couple other areas here it, that require further diligence is um, chapter 2.1, 3.1, 3.2, and this all relates to hiring, employee relations, labor, um, employee, employee classifications. We just wanna check for compatibility with Measure G because we have special um, charter provisions for, for us as a board. Um, same goes with performance evaluation. So that those will all be issues we would look for compatibility with Measure G. Not to say after we've done our analysis we wouldn't adopt it. Um, I just don't know off the top of my head. Uh, it requires further uh, attention. Um, training and development. This might also be another area where we would ad adopt our own policies because we do have the duty of prudence that requires us to be up to date and go to uh, more trainings than I think typically a city employee would have to go to. So that might be something where we would either um, in, in, institute our own policy on or we'll look further at the city's policy to see if there's just ways we just make minor tweaks. Um, and then purchasing and procurement. Um, there are a few here that we, it's, it's kind of, a, they've got a lot of, um, they've got uh, policies one through 15. So there's 15 policies for the city. Um, we would wanna look through most of them to make sure that they suit our needs. Um, there are a few that we can automatically adopt. So if you look at page three of uh, the chart, uh, I recommend adopting uh, poli city policy numbers 5.15, 5.11, 5.113, 5 5.114. Um, and the rest of them I, I think would require further diligence to take a look at and for further consideration. Um, you know, there were just a few that I, you know, I put out for caution. I just included because I'm not sure. I didn't have a chance to fully look at. So again, to your point, um, energy fund transfers and deposits. I'm not entirely sure what that policy is. Maybe um, someone here could tell me. But otherwise, we would uh, want to take a look, further look at that and come back to de determine whether or not that would impact us in our operations. Um, another one would be the loan provisions under Chapter 5.3. Um, we haven't had the opportunity to fully look at those, and so we reserve um, our right to adopt those or decide to edit those. And the same with uh, transfer of sur surplus property. We would, again, just want to take a look at that. But other than that, the balance, as you'll see here, the, the balance of the city policies, I believe it would be prudent for us to adopt um, with those exceptions for further consideration. And part of the reason why I bring this to the board now is that you know this, the city mayor's le uh, letter required us to come back within 45 days, and our next meeting would be really pushing up against that deadline, which I believe is December 8th. And so um, I'm bringing this to the board for consideration to adopt, in, in part, um, the recommended city policies. With that, I'll leave it up to any questions. Some of the funding is from the city, right? Right. How do so we kind of bridge that gap. Right. So to maintain our tax qualified status, we do need to maintain our independence from the plan sponsor, um, particularly in plan administration. So a lot of the areas here, for example, fair employment is not really a plan administration function; it's an HR function, and so that's where we would maintain our independence. So contract procurement issues, for example, we've had some issues with our contracts. Um, particularly with our benefits di division um, for, for example, our pension administration plan, we have a death benefit, so uh, now I'm getting the nitty gritty. So we have a contract with a service. When members die, each month that service comes and tells us that here's a list of people who have passed away based on the social security records. I think the vendor's PBI. And we've been having issues getting the, that vendor contract approved and um, paid but it's a critical function of our plan. So that's an area, for example, we would want to make sure that we are stand good on those contracts and make sure those contracts are um, working on a daily basis in a routine way. So Maytag, great job. I mean, fantastic detail and we compliment, heads off to you. Um, question on 5.1, this is what overlaps with our most recent internal audit report. Um, is this, this is what Cortex is Developing the developing board zone policy. Yes, so the Cortex, as far as I understand it, Barbara may be able to speak on it more. Um, they are currently looking at the city's procurement policies and looking at OSER's uh, procurement policy and contracting policy, 
and looking at the, the needs of our department to decide and present a, uh, a proposed procurement and contract and contracting policy to the governance committee, which I believe is meeting on November 27th. And what about the rest of the reviews? Who, who is, who's gonna perform the reviews with compatibility with Measure G in, in the other areas? And so that, that work would be uh, delegated down to the governance committee, and the governance committee can tell us which ones they want us to prioritize and review. Um, to make that determination. But is, is council going to be presenting to governance committee? Is that going to be cortex or management or? Well, we can we can make that we can we can talk about that in a further meeting. We don't have that currently agendized. Currently agendized is just the adoption of these these policies here. Um, how we go about addressing the other areas is um, still in the works. I don't have a response to that yet. Awkward here, but um, on the uh, procurement, Barbara and I, Heyman, are meeting tomorrow. We've got an advanced version of a draft policy, which we will share with council. I think on uh, November sixteenth, I think we had agreed on. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. that's when that's when the, um, the procurement policy will be sent for legal review. Yeah, that's all I had to. Add. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly on the front burner given both internal auditor and city auditor. But I, I'm just wondering, uh, the mayor's letter, the 45-day deadline versus the uh, your response to the city auditor of June of next year, how, how are we, what are we looking to do in 45 days and what are we looking to do? Sure, so when I appeared before city council, and, um, con uh, not congresswoman, I almost just elevated you. <laughs> a councilwoman Foley was there as well. Is that um, initially I had thought that they, they wanted a determination of whether or not we would adopt all policies from the city or not. The mayor clarified that what they're looking for is really just a status update. So we would report back with our status of what where we are in terms of the adoption of which policies and what determinations we've made. Okay, so we still have until next year to to, to, to round it out. Yes. No, that's right. Thank you. And just to be clear, it doesn't mean that we will finish it by June. Our goal will be to be completed earlier. Right. But I, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to give a day that we were not possibly not meet. So since they agreed to June, we are going to use that one. But if we can be done by March or sooner, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you. clarification this wasn't a letter from the mayor this was a memorandum that the what that went along with the audit report that was adopted unanimously by City Council so this was a policy that the City Council adopted that we encourage you to take a look at the different areas laid out in the audit uh, procurement being one of them uh, but as I mentioned earlier cybersecurity is a huge issue and very concerning. I'm not going to go into detail here, but you should take that very seriously when you're looking at provisions to protect your systems. Um, and, then, and on that point, we are recommending adopting Chapter 1.7 on technology. Thank you. I, I think that's really important. I, I also want to say that the city has its policies and procedures and that they have been well vetted over the years. We each we recently had an audit on our procurement process and the auditor made recommendations on our procurement process and some of the changes will we will be will actually be implementing all of them as well. My responsibility again is different than your responsibility. My responsibility is to look out for the taxpayers funds and how they're being allocated. And in many ways there, it's very difficult to separate the duty, the, the roles of the city in relation to the role of the retirement services. Number one, because all of your employees are employees of the city of San Jose, and many of them are uh, uh, parties to bargaining units and negotiations through the city of San Jose and not independent of the retirement services. That's just one example. The reason uh, I, I do want to highlight uh, the travel policy too, and I think there is some flexibility about the cheapest travel. Where there is not flexibility, uh, and I strongly encourage you to look at 
a travel policy that limits the type of travel. We pushed back, for example, on a travel uh, voucher for, for going first class on a plane or business class when normally we travel coach. So whether you fly San Francisco or San Jose, that's not the issue, it's a cheaper expense. Likewise, if you're going to a convention, you should be staying in a convention hotel and not looking at a five-star hotel or one that is more expensive down the street because it has nicer accommodations. That's not the role and function of a fiduciary. As I'm looking at a taxpayer dollars, I'm thinking, how can I justify that? If I'm staying at a fancy hotel, how do I justify that my, to my residents? So just understand you have your role and you will make your decisions on how you're going to go forward through these, through your governance committee and such. That's, our pers that's my perspective as a council member who supported the memo that the uh, mayor brought forth. I actually made the motion to support the mayor's memo. The 45 days is to find, to hear what's your plan, that you're taking a look at it. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, can I make some comments unless the board wants to? So a couple of things. Um, so I, I just want to uh, make it clear because I've been in meetings, uh, two or three of them that I have heard the cybersecurity issue come up. And respectfully, I, I don't want the public to believe that um, the Office of Retirement Services do not have cybersecurity controls or do not follow them because it's the third time that I have heard comments that to the naked eye could just be assumed as that's the case. I just want to make it really clear that our office follows the cybersecurity uh, measures by the city. In fact, um, every month we get uh, the report from the uh, IT department of the city on the staff um, training of cybersecurity. And I'm very proud to say that our department is pretty much most of the time on the top three or five of the whole city. Uh, so cybersecurity is clearly uh, an important issue for us. Uh, we think very highly of the IT department for the city. Um, I had an issue like other uh, employees at the city where one time there was an email that I responded to, you know, that uh, they were looking to try to get access to the city, quickly reach out to the IT department um, and work with the cybersecurity director. And the, my only reason for saying this is that after that, in one of our quarterly meetings, we asked the cybersecurity director to present to our staff to reinforce the importance of cybersecurity. So I, I, you know, I'm just concerned that when comments are made publicly like that, uh, you know, people may, s may s think that we, we do not believe on it or we do not follow it. And, and the truth is it cannot be further from the truth. We do, we stand by it. We believe, uh, and, and I th we do have controls and we follow the city requirements on that issue. On the travel, uh, your point is well taken, council member. I completely agree with you, but again, I wanna make it clear that I think the flexibility that we are referring to is not about spending more money, but it's about, uh, for example, uh, as, as council indicated, sometimes uh, maybe even $10 more to live from SFO than San Jose, but for logistics reasons, it's easier for the staff to leave from San Francisco to San Jose. And it seems to me that $10 should not call uh, whether the staff should be leaving from one uh, hotel, I mean, one airport on the other one. A and in terms of the hotels, in fact, there was a time where uh, our CIO was gonna be attending a conference and there was a hotel that was actually cheaper than the conference hotel. But I guess the policy wouldn't allow him to stay at a less expensive hotel. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that there's that flexibility that, that we, we agree with you completely. We, we value uh, the plans and want to make sure that we don't spend more money than we have to. We just want to make sure that from a logistical standpoint, uh, it makes it easier for us to be able and staff and trustees to travel and also to reimburse those expenses. So 
I, I just wanted to make that point clear uh, because uh, um, we think uh, wholeheartedly the security and controls are critical to any function and obviously they have to be efficient and effective and there are gaps in some of the issues that uh, the city auditor and the internal auditor found. Uh, we uh, stand ready to work on those gaps, but uh, I just want to publicly make it clear that um, we controls are important to us and we intend to make sure that we run the office as, as efficient and effective as possible. Thank you. This is for discussion and action. Um, what I'm uh, requesting from the board is an adoption of the backup material uh, that's posted with item 4J. I'll make that motion. Second. Move motion from Dave Wilson, second by Santos. Any further is discussion? The board of Governance going to be there? No, so, the, so the, the other issues that, for example, where it says look further into or make consistent with Measure G or have any other caveats, yes, those would be issues that we would bring up with the Governance Committee. But for the, for the majority of the document, it's just to show that we adopt, for example, um, you know, wherever it indicates adopt. So we are voting on the, your recommendation on what we should adopt. Yes, adopt. And, and, and in addition to what we should be looking further into. All, right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Maytag, can I just ask for Chapter 5.1? Um, it says adopt city policy number 5.15. Is that is that actually 5.1.15? Oh, I missed a one there, but yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Discussion for H, right? Discussion and action to appoint ad hoc executive search committee. So okay. I, I want to have a question for you as our, our as far, sorry. Um, isn't this kind of a function of the JPC? Um, I think that's one possibility. I guess uh, what I was told by Harvey was that the board has to make the decision. <coughs> Either the JPC does it or you separate, which I think Andrew mentioned that maybe you, you have you know, different board members look at it, but I'm open to either one. The JPC can handle it too. So, so here's, here's uh, how this piece got on the agenda. So at the last federated board meeting, our, our sister plan, uh, they add, decided to, put to add for a future agenda, I propose agenda item, the appointment of an ad hoc committee for a CEO search. So because of the, that timing for their agenda and your meeting in between, I thought it would be prudent to add this onto our agenda as well so that we're acting in parallel. Um, the JPC charter <coughs> provides that the JPC has authority to retain a, a executive search firm. And what the idea is for this agenda item is to, uh, to appoint a liaison from this plan to work with the, uh, an appointed liaison from the other plan and work with the um, executive search firm that's retained by the JPC and then report back uh, their findings. Okay. Is, this, is, this different than, is this different than a liaison that we already have on the JPC? Yeah. Yeah. Separate? Yes, yes because um, I think the, the individual from Federated that wants to serve in that function is not a member of the JPC. So this is my just my sense here. Um, I think this is exactly what the JPC was created for. Um, you have both chairs, which are key. You also have both IC chairs, right? Now, granted, this search is for the CEO and the CIO, but then it's even more critical for the CIO search. And then one other trustee. Um, so this is completely up to you, board, to decide how you want to proceed. I would think that if you're going to have an executive uh, a, a, um, ad hoc committee comprised of about the six members, you might as well use you uh, join audit. I mean, join audit committee. <laughs> Sunita, I've been working with you so long. That's what comes to my mind. The JPC, but 
if you do want to do an, uh, a, a committee that is uh, comprised of a larger number, which I don't know if you're, able, if you're able to, you can, right? Because yeah, so the idea here would be an ad hoc committee would provide them more flexibility because ad hoc committees are, are existing for a limited period of time for a limited purpose, and so they're not subject to the Brown Act. That, that is, that, that's the final issue. It does makes it easier to um, call for meetings. They're not uh, um, obviously ruled by Brown Act, so they're not public meetings per se. So from that standpoint, it makes it easier. That is absolutely true. So, so I'd like to ask Eshwar, because <coughs> since it's, this does really, is what JPC was created for, and you're chair of JPC, what would, what would be your preference in this? I think the JPC can do it, handle it, right? That was my initial thinking. Um, but I, I was, you know, I, I was told maybe there was other ideas about it. So I'm open either way, but the JPC can handle it. I, I just yeah. don't get the idea of a liais liaison to yeah. work with the JPC. Well, no, the liaison would work with the executive search firm. So the executive search firm will report back to the two liaisons from the both boards. I, mean, I do believe this is what the JPC is for. Yeah. And last time we did a CEO and a CIO search, we didn't have a JPC at the time. We had an ad hoc. Yeah. But we made a JPC for these type of purposes. There are right. HR, would you say. So I think this should be belonging to the JPC. If yeah. the JPC really wants to have a liaison you know, to communicate with the searching firm, they could create an ad hoc and put one person on each side onto it. But I do believe the JPC should be control, sure. um, taking a lead yeah. on this. And, I'm fine and, with that. Yeah, and, and also, too, whoever you pick uh, for your liaison from police and fire can be on the JPC. Yeah. I'm just telling you this one piece of information from Federated, the individual from Federated that's thinking about um, volunteering mm -hmm. is not on the JPC. So that's why it's coming on as the agenda item rather than through the JPC. And. And who sits on the JPC? I mean, Federate can do what they want. If they want this particular person to sit on the JPC, yeah. they could make they those changes too. They can certainly do too. that too. Yeah, they can change up the committee So, but, I mean, this belongs, whenever we do a search, any type of search in the future, mm -hmm. it should be handled in that form. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree with those statements. As you heard what I said, the, the only caveat is, I think, what council indicated, the flexibility of scheduling meetings that are not subject to Branagh requirements. Um, I, I'm only saying that because I do agree with you. I just, you heard my words. Uh, I, I know Eswar has been asking for about 60 days now to request a JPC meeting, and we have not been able to schedule one because we have not been able to find a quote where people is available to meet. Obviously, that couldn't be the case if they're doing the search. <laughs> I mean, we could depute two members of the JPC. That's what I'm to yeah, an ad hoc, ad hoc of, of the yeah. JPC. Yes, that's what I, yeah. yeah. Yes, we could do I think that. that's a bit. Yeah. Okay. So Lederman has his hand up. Go ahead, Harvey. No, unnecessary. All good. Oh, okay. Oh, we got <laughs> <laughs> I can't see one. <laughs> so does this need to be a motion? Yes. Yeah, so you do need to appoint someone to serve uh, for that ad, for this ad hoc committee liaison. I it, it, can, it can be yeah. someone from the JPC that's currently on the JPC. I think the board is leaning in the opposite direction. I think yeah. the board's recommendation yeah. is that this should be handled at the JPC level. Right. And then at the JPC meeting, if they want yeah. to create an ad hoc, they can at that time. Okay, that's fine too. And I believe we have a meeting in next two weeks and we can put yes. it on the agenda. Yes. Okay, is that a motion? Uh, yes, yes, that's my motion. Second. Okay, I have a motion from Gardner, second from Dick. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, I feel like I'm talking a lot today. <laughs> next, next, we have the nomination and the position <laughs> of the board chair and vice chair for the calendar year. So before I go into that, I did want to read through the board's some key highlights of our election policy because now that Chair Votto is, are, is from this... <coughs> Part of the, so sorry, I'm getting a little tongue-tied here, they're talking so much. Um, chair Votto is now uh, chair from vice chair, and generally speaking, each year when we have a chair, we flip from the various groups. And so because he's of the safety member group or the membership group, the chair nomination technically from our policy has to be from the public member group for the calendar year to serve as chair. 
Now, the policy does allow for a, 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 a amendment to the policy to, or an exception to the policy if a supermajority votes of the six members, and we can change the policy to allow um, Chair Votto to continue to chair for next year. But I did want to make that uh, information known to you while you consider nominations for next for uh, for the chair and vice chair positions. Now, um, ter in terms of policy, we generally do the nominations in November, and we can have multiple nominations for multiple <coughs> members uh, from multiple or for multiple positions. And then in December, our policy requires us to elect a chair and a vice chair um, by a majority of six votes. <coughs> I just want to say that when the policy was created many, <coughs> many months ago, um, this board was not as cohesive as it is today. Not that it's not needed. Also, I do want to say that I don't think the board envisioned a situation where your chair will resign in the morning and the vice chair becomes the chair, right? So. With that caveat, I, I think that it would be appropriate for you, board, and I don't want to speak for counsel. Obviously, she has the legal background. I do not. It would be appropriate for you to designate or to formulate or to ask the current vice chair to continue as a chair, assuming, um, you can't tell by the look, but assuming that he wants to continue being the chair, he's smiling, I'm sure he is. Um, that just, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have a lot going on right now uh, with the retirement board, and Frank has had his hands in most of it because you know Drew is on vacation for those two months. Um, I think it would be prudent to keep him in that position should he be willing to accept it. I second that. Should you move more motion to change the policy then? Uh, no, the, the, the policy is not up or uh, it's not agendized that way, but we can take mental note of it for the following meeting um, in light of the nominations and comments. That yeah. are and, I, and I honestly don't count what happened today switching, meaning that, okay, a plan member has been in this position for the full year. I mean, basically, it'll be two months this month mm -hmm. and next month. Right. So to me, um, I don't think the policy comes into play here, but that's Agreed. me. But I would also second the nomination if he wants it. Uh, considering that I do have my hands in so much right now, probably makes the most sense. Um, so I, I will accept it. Um, question for the vice chair, does the vice chair have to be a public member? Um, do so they have to alternate, you know? So let's see here. Offset. It's the wreck. That's what I thought. I, I can tell you the policy requires that they're opposite, so if the chair is a Member of the plan, the buy shares should be a, yes, a that's right. public be member. However, again, I can't emphasize this enough. When that poli when that policy was created, this board <coughs> functioned differently than it's functioning today. Second, um, that same policy, I believe, requires that the chair is nominated for just one year. It could be two, assuming that you have, I think, eight members approving it. Mm -hmm. And Seven. just wanted to remind you that the current chair was chair for three years, mm -hmm. not just one, not just two for three. My only point here is that's a policy. Certainly, you want to adhere to your policy as much as possible, but it doesn't mean that you don't have some flexibility. That's so, so if uh, Chair Votto is the nominee for chair, the um, vice chair needs to be a public member. I nominate Eshwar. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Should he be willing to accept? Uh, I think I have a lot of things to do, so I would say if Sunita, Harvard, David, if you want to, if you're up to it. Um, I do want to mention the pay is the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it should. Yeah, I, w I was going to say it should go to the person who has should the mo most experience. And I'm the one with the least amount of experience because <laughs> I'm the last one to join the board. So it doesn't make sense to go in my direction. So I would probably nominate Sunita or Howard. I'm very open to either one. You guys done a good job. Well, I appreciate the, the, the kind words. I, I, I don't think I could commit right now uh, given my, my schedule. 
But I, I think, David, I think you have a lot of experience in general outside of the, the board, and uh, you, you, might, uh, you may enjoy the experience uh, watching Franco in action. You guys are action. really lucky you didn't show up to the meeting because you know how that works. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to be the one that uh, accepts this position by default when everybody else. I mean, Sunita, I mean, you're, you have more experience than I have, more time on the board. So if you want to vice chair position, I am very supportive. Uh, I think that if, if I take that up, I probably want to get somebody else in the audit chair seat. <laughs> no, I mean, the way that those committees have been going, it's I don't pretty tough. disagree with you. And I wanted to talk to you after the board meeting anyway, but <laughs> um, so my only point with the policy was, I'm not suggesting you do this, but if, if there are no public members, although it appears Sunita is really willing to serve as a vice chair, I just, I really will, I know it's a lot of work, I, and I'm not suggesting you don't do that, but I really will hate to lose you as the chair of the audit committee because you have been so involved on this current situation and we're still working through it uh, that I was hoping you can at least remain the chair for a couple more meetings and then maybe chair of the audit committee and then maybe after that, but obviously I don't know your um, how much work you have outside the board, so uh, I, you know I won't put you in that position. But I appreciate your willingness to serve as a vice chair. So I don't know, Howard, would you step into, or D Dave, would you step into chair of audit? Uh, I because you're being as involved. I mean, it's not. Uh, yeah, much. I I I have that. I we would have the capacity for that. Uh, likely, so I, I I could do that if if Dave wants to assume it. I'll, either way, yeah, I'm open to either way. I'm sitting on a lot, sit on a few boards myself, but um, yeah, I, I could probably take that on. If it, or you have more experience uh, on the board here than I do. I'm I'm second junior to Dave to the left. So actually, Howard has more experience than I do, but oh. by a few months, yeah. So I would so defer to your Howard, so it so sounds good. like so. I mean, so I'm okay so staying so on for a say till March. Yeah, but after that, yeah, I'd I, like I, I could in a transition with you. Yes, the answer would be yes. So the audit committee. So I don't know if that answers our vice chair question. No, so no, no, that, that was for the. She was asking oh, how are for the okay. audit committee so she can become the vice chair. I, is that is that yeah is that exactly? Right? I, I can't commit yes. to both. But yeah, I mean, and I appreciate the willingness. Thank you so very much. If Howard and I want to trade, then. Okay, can I, can yeah, I make back to the audit committee? Yeah. I'm, I'm not even following anymore. <laughs> okay, so, so the nominations would be for uh, Chair Valdo to continue to be chair and then for Sunita to be vice chair. I, I'm going to put down for future agenda items the um, s committee assignments. So thank you, Dave, for the nomination, but I think Sunita is great. Too. <laughs> Thanks for voting. Okay, I'm assuming we vote on this. No, there's no vote necessary no. for the nomination. nomination. So I can't abstain. <laughs> <laughs> no, not now. Okay. Downhill slide. All right. Retirements. Do you find Jay already run? Yes, we did. Yes, thank you. I'll put this on here because it's easier to read. Okay, service retirements. Kim M. Borenson, fire engineer, fire department, effective October 13th, 2023, 21.01 .01 years of service. Brett McDonald, Fire Engineer, Fire Department, effective December 7th, 2023, 29 years of service with reciprocity. Edward Ramos, Police Officer, Police Department, effective December 8th, 2023, 25.09 years of service. John D. Shaheen, Police Officer, Police Department, effective December 9th, 2023, 27.26 years of service. Donald Torres, Fire Captain, Fire Department, effective December 7th, 
27.86 years of service with reciprocity. And then we do defer, defer vested separately, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Motion Santos. Second Gardener. Second Gardener. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Defer vested. Don Marchetti, police officer, police department, effective November 23rd, 2023, 20.16 years of service with reciprocity. And I'll lump those all up if anyone wants to say anything. Andrew. Yeah, I wanna thank you, uh, the gentlemen that are retiring from the fire department. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, I've worked with all of them. They're all great people. And I hope you have a long and prosperous retirement. Yeah, I'll say the same for the police officers. I know them both personally. As a matter of fact, uh, John Shaheen was the best man at my wedding. Uh, we got hired together. Um, he's leaving a year before I am, so I'm a little jealous, and uh, he's going to have to buy me the beers from the, the here on out. So, Okay. Thank you. Death and survivorship notifications. Notification of the death of Edward C. Marini, police officer, retired January 12th, 2008, died September 6th, 2023 survivorship benefits to Nancy Marini spouse notification of the death death of Lauren Lawrence J Otter police officer retired March 7th 1985 died July 27th 2023 no survivorship benefits notification of the death of Terrence P Ryan fire captain retired March 6 1997 died August 21st 2023 survivorship benefits to Irene Ryan spouse notification of the death of Gustavo Vega police officer retired July 29 2013 died October 10th 2023 no survivorship benefits and then we have an, another thing here which is job title correction for deceased retiree Roy Ilse from fire captain to police lieutenant from the October 5th, 2023 board meeting. Yeah, that's correction. And I'll do a moment of silence. Okay, does anyone need something Yes, I'll let Dave, Dave go first and I'll be glad to say something. <coughs> yeah, I, I know, I knew uh, Ed Marini just briefly and, and the other uh, gentleman uh, obviously had a, a a very long uh, career and uh, storied career and uh, just my hearts and prayers and thoughts with their family and friends. Yeah, it's uh, sad that uh, they all have passed and they're all special, but I want to point out that Terry Ryan was my first fire captain in 1968. He was a Korean War veteran and he died at about 90 years old. And he was a real special person and definitely miss him and the best of his family. Thank you. So we have committee minute reports and recommendations. Investment committee. Uh, we've had no, <coughs> no meetings since the last uh, board meeting. So. Okay. So nothing to report. Audit risk. Yeah. Um, we actually have been meeting fairly often. Um, we had another meeting since the last board meeting and um, we uh, rediscussed a couple of the findings uh, from the audit report, internal audit report from me, or the management's response to that. There was a long discussion, and I think we came to a good conclusion on both of those. Um, and I believe, is the modified uh, response in this? I, I, I don't remember looking at it, sorry. Um, it's not yet in this, okay. So maybe it will be in the next, okay. So uh, I'll just say that, uh, I think the meeting went, uh, we, we had three big discussion items. One was, as I said, the two, rediscussing two of the findings. The second was on the annual report, uh, of which we have uh, deferred the investment section of the annual report until the NGO audit on the investment fees is completed, uh, but accepted the rest of the, uh, the report. Uh, I think it's, when do they come to the board for the financial statements? Is that? Uh, the last meeting. In December, is it? No. 
You're talking about Messias Jenny? Yeah. They came to the board. Did they come to the board again after yeah. the audit committee? No, they, they don't come to the board. They just come to the other committee, and the other committee recommends to the board okay. approval. So I guess we do have an action item around that. So that was the other big discussion. I, I don't think I missed anything else. Uh, did I? Nothing else. I oh, the, the only other one was the, um, the pro procurement and contracting policy with Cortex. The, the audit committee had decided to um, assign that to the, to the governance committee for, and for the policy also to be uh, reviewed by the governance committee by the end of November. That's right. So we, right. we decided that, thank you, uh, Mirak. Um, we decided that it was, uh, it, it, it fit in better with the governance committee's responsibilities to take it on from here. Uh, and we also accelerated the timeline for that review to November, um, uh, not to finalize it, but to have a, a good draft in front of the government. Yeah, first reading. Yeah. Um, and that's it for me. So I think we want to receive and file the minutes. I, I don't know if Franco does that. Or yes. Yeah. Just receive and file the minutes. And I would recommend deferring um, items 7.2C and 7.2D um, because management has not uh, provided their updated amended response yet. Okay. We'll defer those items. And then they do have to take action on 7E. Discussion and action regarding communication to the Board of Administration of the City of San Jose Police and Fire Retirement Plan from the CS. Jeannie and O'Connell, the plan's external auditor. Yeah, so they presented to the audit committee uh, a clean report on the financials. And I believe this is, uh, that's what is up in front of the board. Right, Roberto? Um, they, they presented the findings. And uh, I think the request here is for you board to uh, take action on um, the communication to the board on the audit report and their management letter and also approve the police and fire retirement plan and a comprehensive financial report that will be 7F. They, they have a long presentation. They uh, actually answer questions and it's a clean opinion. Uh, there's some um, <coughs> detailed work that they're finalizing, but uh, in any case, that will be and I believe the committee, if I'm mistaken, either Meta or Cosunita, correct me, I think the committee did accept their presentation and, and is in a position to make a recommendation to the board to, uh, to take action on those, two, on those two items. Yeah, minus the investment section. Correct. I, don't, I, I can't open the 7.2F. That, that excludes the investment section? It's kind of hanging. Yeah, I, mean, Akbar, I think, if I recall from the board uh, audit committee meeting, we had a, a slightly reduced version that we were going to present to the board yeah. after discussion on the, uh, I think it was the investment returns. That's right. Yeah, so the investment section is still in here. That shouldn't be in here. Right, and also it has a, the board chair letter that was Yeah, the board letter was going to be pulled. Right, mm -hmm. so Correct. so the, the oh. attachment that was provided for the uh, item 4F is incorrect. It's incorrect, Correct. Um, so I think we do we, we defer that then until it's correct. Bainty, are you are you in the meeting? Yes, I'm in the meeting. Um, that is the full act for, and um, Drew did want his board chair letter in there even before the um, audit. I believe you were copied on the email, Roberto. Yes. Um, <laughs> and as far as the investment section, if we we're going to pull that out after until after <laughs> the um, audit, then. Um, MGO will provide um, a revised opinion letter that's going to exclude all the, um, that section. Well, but so, so, thanks, Benji. Thanks, Benji. But, but the audit the, committee had voted um, for the recommendation to the board to remove the letter from Drew. So, okay. So you want that removed even after Drew wanted it in there? That's correct. Okay. So we will pull that out of there. And then, um, well, we won't be posting the act for it until it's complete. Um, we are also hoping that this is done before the end of the year because the GFOA submittal is due at the end of the year, year to in order to receive our um, annual certificate of um, achievement. Benji, you, you attended the last audit committee, correct? I did, but okay. I, it was not very clear which action was going to be taken. Okay, let me make sure that um, we're all clear, myself, you, and the rest of the board. Um, 
when when the board is referring to um, not including the investment section, um, I I think they're referring to um, just like the ACFR has an actuarial section yeah. that comes from Chiron, there is one that comes from Mikita, correct? Uh, uh, right. right, I understand what the investment Not to include that, but um, I think Messias Gini mentioned they can still offer a clean opinion, it's just that their actual letter will not then actually address that section because that will not be included, at least in the meantime, in the act for, is that what they said? So, 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 so I, just I just have, have yes, yeah. that is correct, but I, I do have a point of clarification. The backup document that's subject for the board's approval today is the same backup document that was presented at the joint audit committee. My understanding from uh, MGO was that they would provide us a, an updated version for the board to adopt at our November meeting. However, it sounds like we need to get this done by the end of December. Is there room for us to defer this item, Roberto and Benji, for us to have like an updated version to uh -huh. actually review and approve? I think so. I just have to ask Benji. Uh, yeah, that's not difficult. Okay. Yes, they can provide an updated version uh, taking that section out? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yes. I think what I remember, I remember from the audit committee is that the ACFR, we will, we will report on the ACFR in December after the investment section. The that's investment right. fee audit is complete, <laughs> and if the investment section is corrected, well, or some I, disclosures. I, I'm not yeah. sure that. I cannot tell you for sure that the work by Messias Gini on the investment uh, fees audit will be completed in time for the investment section to be included. Does that make sense, Benji? Yes, that is correct. So uh, ideally that will be the case, but <coughs> we need to be mindful that if they're not completed with the work, we need to move ahead and approve the statements without the investment section. I think what you're saying, let me make sure I understand, if they finish the audit, you want number one, the report on their findings, and number two, you want that section included as it should be. Basically, that's what you're saying for the December meeting. Um, no, I think that Harvey probably remembers this the best, but I think to Harvey uh, raise this objection and or, or the discussion, and my recollection is that if uh, there will be at least some disclosure if we are not able to finalize the numbers saying that these might be revised. Right, so I, I think the issue here is that MGO may have had an updated ACFR and we didn't receive it in time for posting with their agenda. So my recommendation to the board is to defer this item until December and actually get the document so we can take a look at it before we approve it. Yeah, agreed. At the December meeting. At the December yeah, meeting. Be before the deadline of the 31st. Correct. Yes. There was also, if I may, there was also a desire for the manage, management letter uh, to be signed by the chair, and in this case, the chair of the board will be Franco Vado, signing that manager the, the management letter. Uh, but that the language of it changed to be less precise about representing what the returns, the annual returns were, and benchmark returns and that sort of thing, uh, since they are unaudited and. Uh, they may differ, uh, so that cover letter needs to be revised uh, in a way to make the representation accurate that it's an estimate and not a, uh, a certified number. Right, so, so essentially what we need is MGO and staff to go back to the audit committee and bring forth that, the, the revised um, report for adoption and defer this item. Just want to make sure you are clear, Benji. Are you clear? I'm not clear what management letter Harvey is talking about. He, he, he's, he's referencing the board chair. He, he's yes. asking. Uh, he's referring to the board chair letter. Okay. Yes. The board chair letter. Got it. Um, we need to just take another look at that, and where a certain a certain return number, for example, is represented to so many basis points. We need at least to say that the, you know these these are estimated numbers or approximate numbers, and they are unaudited. Okay. One more thing: did we did we just vote on seven point two e? Sorry. No, we voted. We deferred um, seven point f. We still yes. need to take the vote on seven point okay. e. Seven point two e says still says draft. I thought the idea was audit committee would approve a draft. Uh, 
pending the finalization before the board meeting. That was my recollection as well. Yeah. People are looking at me, so <laughs> I, I, do you want an answer or do you want me to? Well, yeah, either either Benji well, or has to Richard. go to the city, right? The, the financial. The, yes, the, the, we had the meeting with the city yesterday afternoon on the okay. city financials. Uh, Benji, can you address the last question, please? I think um, MGO was going to provide a final draft when when the opinion was provided. Um, we're trying to wrap that up today. So if we can defer this to next month as well, then we can have a final copy. Okay, so okay, let's so defer, defer item, item E as well. But has this gone to the city, the, finance, the audited financials? The, um, we have not given them the financial statement. I mean, we've given them drafts of it, so that way they can extract their portions um, for their act for, but um, we have not given them a final copy. Okay, because I thought there was this timing mismatch that the, mon the, the statements need to go to the city. Uh, we had this discussion again. Yes, so um, Benji, if I miss speak here, please correct me. Um, there is a difference between having the final version of the act for versus making sure that the sections that the city needs for their statements are completed. So the sections related to the work by the city for their statements as to say, pension liability or pension expense, that's all completed. So that was provided to the city. They have it, it's draft because the report hasn't been finalized, as you can tell. But those sections were provided and not only did uh, Benji's uh, group had the meeting with the counterpart at the city, but yesterday we met with the finance director and they actually finalized a discussion on the city experts. So as far as I'm concerned in terms of city work, we are completed on providing them what they need, except for the fact that once these uh, statements are finalized mm -hmm. and they have final, uh, after all the changes or requirements are completed, then we'll make sure that we provide those documents to the city. So, so but, but one second, Roberto. Um, if we defer 7.2E, does that, that conflict with your ability to provide the city mm. audited financials? I understand no. not the act for. No, no, I, no, it, it does not, right, Benji? That's correct. We are working um, to get the opinion from the um, auditors from MGO today, so that way the financial statement section will be final today, and so it won't affect the city's act for. Okay, so the, uh, the financial sta audited financial statements will go to the city but the, it'll come to the board in December. Yes, Correct. So it'll come to the board after it goes to the city. I just wanted to m make sure that everybody's aware of that. So G, there's a backup to that, and I can briefly speak to it, if that's okay, uh, Trustee Ganapati. Yes, please. Okay, so um, with with item G, Cortex had come up with a proposed timeline of uh, addressing our contracting procurement issues and coming up with the proposed draft for first reading. Um, the, the committee decided to truncate that and they took an oral motion to uh, refer this matter over to the governance committee and have the draft uh, presented to the governance committee on by the end of November for our first reading. And so that's the uh, item for approval for the board. Motion to approve. So moved. <clears throat> Motion by Sunita, second by Dave Wilson. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. I think that's finally it for governance. Uh, next is, or for audit. Next is governance. We have not had a meeting, so there's nothing to report. And then uh, Dick. Disability Committee. Am I sir? Anyway, on November 6th, <coughs> at 10 o'clock at the uh, retirement office will be our next Disability Committee, and we'll miss Drew's leadership. And the rest is the oral update, that's it. And I think, Dave, you're gonna... I'll be there on this day. Okay. Thank you. Oh, for the record, we're, we're not having a meeting on November 16th, the audit committee, right? It's canceled. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, joint personnel committee. All right, so we haven't met in a while, but we have a meeting <laughs> coming up and a lot of things to discuss. We do need one additional member. 
So, yeah, so I think Maytag um, just mentioned after the lengthy discussion on the uh, ad hoc committee that she took notes on one of the issues that we're going to bring back for your board discussion at the next meeting is the committee assignments. That's right. So we will make sure. Plus, um, we need it for. We, we could still he, meet. He, he is. Still meet, we could still meet, but we okay. both have to be there for quorum. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. The chair has to be part of the chair. But he, he is the chair. So okay. in essence, oh, yes, sure. he is um, now designated. Okay. Has he been voted the chair already? It's by automatic. Yeah, because the by, yeah, so okay. he is now the person uh, to attain the joint personnel committee. Okay. You're doing great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, that's it. All right. Any pro proposed agenda items? Any public comment? Hearing none. Adjourned.